here. If the chair get re elected or wasn't continuing okay. on, so I you can. can. Okay. Sure. All right. Um, good evening, everybody. I would like to call the Concord School Committee to order. At which point, I think we need to mm -hmm. acknowledge that Carrie Rankin was we elected, correct, and appointed at town meeting. And then we need to reconfigure um, the committee. So we would need to reconfigure having a chair and a vice chair. Do we have any nominations Make for nomination. either of those positions? Um, I nominate Alexa Anderson to be chair of CPS. Is there a second? Second. Okay, is this a roll call or if all in yes. favor? Does anyone know? It's a roll call. Anyone Why don't know? we do it by roll call just in case? case? I'm not sure. A roll call vote. Aye. <laughs> that was so enthusiastic. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Mr. Booth? Aye. Rainy Aye. Oh, oh, sorry. I skipped. Marana Aye. I'm sorry. Rainy Aye. That's sorry. Okay. Link and I. Okay, and now. So can I back you up? Because I've got the memo open now. So you need to seat the committee first. A motion to recognize, and you're all named as members of the Concord School Committee. You have to vote and approve that. Okay. Let's, let's supposedly let's before you do the chair. Okay. So the first order of business there is to go. seat the committee, which involves a motion uh, to. Okay. A motion be, need to be made by a Concord School Committee member to. So a motion to recognize Alexa Anderson, Court Booth, Tracy Morano, Cynthia Rainey, and Carrie Rankin as members of the Concord School Committee. Someone can just say so moved. Ooh, <laughs> I'll a second, second that. Okay, even more wonderful. Uh, I guess we'll, it can be just by aye. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. There you go. Aye. Okay. So nominations for chair. Nominations for chair. We do this again, just in case. Why don't you? Alexa, so you've got it in order. Alexa Anderson. Second. <laughs> Okay. The motion is to elect Alexa Anderson chair of the Concord School Committee. Great. So, okay. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Next, we move on to seating a vice chair. Correct. Okay. Would anyone like to make a motion to appoint a vice chair? Um, I nominate Carrie Rankin to be vice chair of the Concord School Committee. Second. Okay. So, motion to elect Carrie Rankin vice chair of the Concord School Committee. You need a second and then. Okay. So, so can you, okay. Marvelous. Second. Court second. Oh, we already did it. All right. Okay. So just voted. And then all in favor. Aye. 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 Apologies. Then, appointment of school committee recording secretary. You need a motion to appoint Eric Higgins as recording secretary. So moved. There you go. Second. All in favor. Aye. 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 All right. And Aye. I. Perfect. Thank you, everyone. Sorry about my lack of. Preparation on that. Well, oh, now we'll, it, it's like a rehearsal okay. for the region. <laughs> okay, so now we need to call to order. I'm going to call to order the Concord Carlisle School Committee. We're 10 minutes ahead of schedule. We are ahead of schedule. I think since you're going into the exact session. Since you're going into the exact session. Okay, and since Sharon's here. <laughs> yeah, we actually have <laughs> <now>. We're lucky. <laughs> okay, so we're called to order. However, is Sarah coming at 545? Want me to text her? I believe well, so, yes. That I think would be courtesy. Yeah, yes. yeah. And we can yeah. Yeah. go in there where my dinner is. Um, Do you want to just text her? Yeah. But we can still move to. We can move. still move yes, to exact yes. session. So if anyone has the motion in front of them, that would be great. I think I do. Um, I've got it. I'm, oh, go ahead, Court. I move that the Concord School Committee and the Concord Carlisle School Committee will enter into executive session under purpose three of the open meeting law to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining with the secretaries and maintenance unions and return to open session at 6.15 p.m. Second. Second. And we're going to roll call. Yes. You Anderson, aye. Booth, aye. Marano, aye for both. Rainey, aye for both. Rankin, aye for both. What, aye for region? All right, and we will be back to open session at 6.15. Great, well done. Done. So tonight we have a very special night at our school committee meeting. All of our meetings are really special, of course, but tonight is extra special. 
Um, it is serving as a graduation ceremony. It's my honor to welcome Mr. David McPhillips, his family, friends, members of the class of 1968 from CCHS to celebrate his graduation from Concord Carlisle High School. A Concord Carlisle High School diploma is an accomplishment and a source of pride for all of our students. For a high school senior, high school graduation is a first step to becoming an adult. As a 17-year-old student, David McPhillips made the honorable decision to enlist in the Marines to serve his country. His decision to serve was his entry into adulthood. After returning from Vietnam, Mr. Phillips went on to receive a GED, a Massachusetts high school diploma, and a bachelor's degree from the University of Massachusetts. A Concord Carlisle high school diploma will now be added to his list of educational accomplishments. On behalf of the Concord Carlisle School Committee, we congratulate you and we appreciate your service. And I would like to introduce Dr. Lori Hunter, Superintendent of Schools. Thank you all and welcome. This has been a real privilege and pleasure over the last couple of weeks interacting with David and getting to know him by email and now tonight in person. And we're really honored and privileged to, to honor him tonight and award him this diploma. Uh, so in accordance with Massachusetts General Law, Chapter 71, Section 4, the school committee may award diplomas to any World War I or II veterans, Korean War veteran or Vietnam War veteran who is a resident of the Commonwealth, who attended the high school maintained by the school committee, who withdrew from secondary school before graduation in order to serve in the armed forces of the United States, who did not receive a high school diploma as a consequence of that service, and who was honorably discharged from the armed services. As Tracy mentioned, David McPhillips attended Concord Carlisle High School prior to enlisting in the Marines in 1968 and being deployed, and then was deployed to Vietnam in 1969. Mr. McPhillips spent a year in Vietnam where he was an engineer battalion and drew plans for buildings and different structures that were needed. In a 2005 interview here in Concord, he described the experience of being building a bridge near a refugee camp called Marble Mountain, where a whole Vietnamese village had been relocated. He described getting along great with the people and enjoying a lot of laughter despite the language barrier. In the 1968 Concord Carlisle High School yearbook, which we blew up here, uh, Mr. McPhillips was described as the boy that had everything going for him in high school, but the call to duty was too strong for him. At this moment, this is from the yearbook, at this moment, Dave is serving his country in the U.S. Marines. Mr. McPhillips is noted to have played hockey and been on the chess club and was nicknamed Babyface by his classmates. Mr. McPhillips was honorably, honorably discharged in 1970 and earned his GED while actively serving. He went on to receive a BA from the University of Massachusetts in 1976. Mr. McPhillips maintained close ties to Concord as an adult including when his son Brian was inspired to enlist and tragically died in combat in April of 2003 while engaging enemy forces in Iraq two days before Baghdad fell. Concord honored Brian during its Memorial Day ceremonies in 2005. As superintendent, I attest that Mr. McPhillips meets the requirements of the law to retroactively receive a 1968 Concord Carlisle High School diploma. It is our privilege to honor him and his family in presenting this diploma during tonight's Concord Carlisle Regional School Committee meeting. And we'll invite David to come on up. I'm going to read this near the mic. I know he's not allowed to say anything we got to say. <laughs> So David, you have satisfactorily completed the course of study prescribed for graduation and are therefore awarded this diploma from Concord Carlisle High School. Congratulations. I'm sure you want to do this. I do. <laughs> we had three classmates that showed up here tonight. Richard Emerson. I think they should come up. They should come up. Mark O'Neill and Greg Holland here. And they can attest that they actually saw me here <laughs> in school in 1968. Welcome, everyone. I think the big difference between myself and the people who are graduating in uh, 2023 is I already know what's happened to me in the last 50 years. 
<laughs> this is great, and I know, uh, according to the MGL, that you may award. Yes, you don't have to. Award. We certainly are honored to. But thank you very much. You are very welcome. And we're going to take some pictures and have a few moments together, but maybe we could get the class of 68 together. With yeah, that'd be great. It's quite a scene right there. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. You know, I'm sorry, I didn't check. <laughs> 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 Very good. Thank you. What about with this point? Do you want to get a picture? Yeah, probably. Okay. Maybe. Okay. 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 Watch it. Why do you go in the middle? You're like, yeah, yeah you're going to just be in the middle. You're 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 in the well, it's a great it's a great opportunity. Right. 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 No judgments, but it's all downhill from here now. Given that, <laughs> Have a great evening. Watch your board, watch the board. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you too. All right. Have a good night. Okay, now this is coming. Coming. all my favorite meeting. Thank you. <laughs> All right. And now we're back to business. That was exciting, though. Very exciting. That was great. Very exciting. Um, we'll just give them one more minute. You want to show them? You can both of them over, maybe? Sure. 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 Okay, and we are ready for a CCHS student update. Uh, Felicity and Harry and Zaria. There they are. Hello. Just Welcome. Need a to share my screen. Did you enjoy our graduation? Yes, that was so exciting. It was really cool to see. I wish we could have been there in person. I know. If we, ever, if we ever get to see that again in our time still at CC. I'll definitely be there. <laughs> um, so we have a pretty quick update this week. Um, obviously, one of the big things at the high school. It's almost the end of AP exams, which for a lot of upperclassmen is pretty exciting. Um big relief of stress. So that's going to be nice. And as I've been saying for the past like four-ish meetings, um, Into the Woods is actually opening this Thursday. Um, ticket sales are looking pretty good, but if you haven't bought tickets, I strongly recommend that you buy tickets because it's going to be really amazing. So there are also shows on Friday and Saturday. There's also a 1 p.m. matinee on Saturday in addition to the regular 7 p.m. shows every night. Um, yeah, I can talk a little bit about this next thing. Um, we have a couple of Senate events coming up in the next couple of weeks. So this Saturday we have our color run. Um, 
if you're not familiar with that, it's kind of a common thing that some towns do, but we're going to have a run around the high school and we bought all of this like colored powder um, and it creates these like fun clouds and explosions of color. And then you can wear like a white shirt and at the end you'll kind of be colored in the rainbow and it's fun to take pictures and things like that. And then we're doing um, a spring spirit, spirit assembly. So kind of similar to what we did in the fall, but it's going to be outside on the football field. We're going to get a dunk tank. Mr. Miller and Ms. Stahl have agreed to participate in that. So it should be a lot of fun. Um, last week, Friday, was our Metco senior dinner. I know that after COVID, it's, I think it paused for a while. And last year, they had it, but it wasn't really the same. But um, I've heard from many people that, that it's basically back and it's looking good. <laughs> uh, it was really fun, too. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. <laughs> It's teacher. Oh. <laughs> yeah, you got that. <laughs> it's teacher appreciation week, and student senate is working on a gratitude video. Uh, I think it's probably going to be really good because it's you know student senate is always very <laughs> thorough. <laughs> yeah, it should be on the Instagram in the coming days. Um, and then one last thing on Friday, May nine, May nineteenth, Nets for Vets is happening. Um, so it's going to be lacrosse games with the boys and girls varsity teams. Um, and proceeds are going to benefit the Hunter Navy Scholarship Foundation. So it's going to be a really great event for the community. Um, I'll definitely be there. And anyone else who comes out, it would be great. So yeah, thank you guys. That's great. What time is the color run? Um, it's going to be 12 o'clock. Well, and is this the first time you guys have done this or no? It is the first one. Yeah. This is the, like the first annual, maybe? Let's hope. Hopefully. All right. <laughs> All right, great. Thank you so much. And good luck in the show. This I should say break a leg. Felicity, are you in it or not in it? This I'm year? actually not able to act in this show, um, but I'm in charge of publicity. So yeah, all the ticket sales and stuff. <laughs> Thank you. You'll see some of us there. So will you be at the shows? You'll be at the shows? I will be at the Saturday 1 p.m. show. Okay. All right. At least. Yeah. Good luck with everything and we will see you at our next meeting so thank you thanks thank guys. you <laughs> all right and that brings us to our public comment section of the meeting and just as a reminder this is the meeting um in the public and not with the public we will start with comments in the room you will have three minutes the school committee will not be responding to any comments so if you have a comment and you're in the room if you could bring me your blue form and if you are online, you can use the raise hand feature and we will alternate between in room. And thank you so much. And online. So up first, we have Liz Crawl, name and address. We're going, um, right at the microphone over there. Sorry, we're moving things around. Hi, my name is Liz Kroll and I live at 212 Hubbard Street. I'm here to support the pilot for embedded levels within the high school English department. In fact, the evidence is unequivocal. Heterogeneous groupings lead to better teaching and learning for all. The concern that teachers won't be able to teach such groupings or differentiate instruction strikes me as misguided. First of all, they already do. Even in BC calculus, there is differentiated instruction. In every class, students come in with all their strengths and weaknesses, and teachers calibrate delivery of instruction and assessment based on this, often, by the way, in real time. Our passionate, incredibly skilled teachers in the English department know how to do this, and I'm happy to hear that professional development will be available as well. I also need to express a continued concern I, that I have had about since the webinar on embedded leveling last Wednesday, and perhaps the incident concerning the police in the Mecca bus has only sharpened that concern. We simply can't dismiss equity and diversity in any discussion of fair education. Some of the arguments last Wednesday went so far as to suggest that certain children wouldn't learn as well or be as well served by an inclusive classroom, even with embedded leveling. I feel compelled to say how that sounded to me like, your kid is gonna bring my kid down. It sounded a lot, a lot like assumptions were being made about students in college prep classes. Of course, though few said it, everyone knows the college prep classes often have disproportionate numbers of populations that may be traditional and marginalized, including ELL students and students of color. 
even as Ms. Hebert, I think it was, pointed out through self-selection. We like to think that these, these divisions are based on ability or ambition, but they are not. They are fabricated. Here, some seem to come dangerously close to pleading some weird exceptionalism about writing and reading language. That exceptionalism, exceptionalism is not only untrue, we only have to look at the world to know how dangerous and demeaning it is, especially to those already marginalized. Please, can we stop beating the myth of division and attend to every student's strengths? Furthermore, there was an interesting discussion about bots and apps and artificial intelligence that may impede original work. I can't imagine a more fertile and fair and intense workshop for original thought than a heterogeneous group of students tackling the written word and writing for each other. Students are so much more likely not to use these devices if they start what they write and share it in class. We want students to understand their connection to each other through literature, and we also want them to find what is original to them. Thank you. Thanks. Hey, thank you. Wow. Impressive. Three, Three seconds, seconds left. left. Three seconds left. Thank you so much. And now we will go online. Um, and please, uh, if you could unblock your screen, I, we have Heidi K. Hi, I think I'll leave it as it is. That's oh, okay. Just unmute. That's um, fine. Yeah. Um, so in the last school uh, committee sorry, meeting. Name and address, please. Sure. Heidi Cater. I live at 100 Elmbrook Lane in Concord. Thank you. So I joined the last school committee meeting. And there was mention of a proposed cell tower that will be installed potentially on the high school property. Um, until that particular meeting, I was unaware that of this cell phone uh, or rather cell tower um, installation. And ironically, just the previous week, I was involved in submitting testimony for a Massachusetts House Bill 2158 which will recognize electromagnetic sensitivity as a disease and also a public health concern. My son is a seventh grade student at the Concord Middle School currently. And as many in the room know, he has the disability of hearing loss. So that makes him particularly susceptible to, um, you know, the effects of electromagnetic radiation. Some common symptoms of exposure to EMR include tinnitus, sleep disruption, headaches, nausea and vomiting, skin rashes, nosebleeds, fainting, loss of focus, and heart palpitations, to name just a few. Um, so since last meeting, I did a little homework, and I determined that in the town of Concord, cell towers can be no closer than a thousand feet uh, uh, near a school building. I called the Tricon Church where there's a proposed cell tower that will be installed. And I found out that they had a pre-existing Sprint Tower hardware that they're upgrading to a Verizon 5G um, tower that will be placed in their steeple. I called the Middlesex School, spoke to the Dean, and in 2018, found out that there was a cell tower that was installed because of, again, a pre-existing uh, hardware installation there. Um, and they were going to place it close to buildings where students were, but they had to remove it from the smokestack and they placed it in a far corner of the campus. So I have um, four questions and a concern that I'd like to raise. So maybe someone can jot these down and they can be addressed when this item is actually um, spoken of in the agenda. So my first question is, if a cell tower is going to be, you know, bulldozed through and just installed without um, the, a vote going to the public, will there be independent monitoring of the EMR levels, similar to, you know, carbon monoxide detectors? Um, and who who would do that? Would it be internal with the school, or would an outside organization monitor the levels of electromagnetic radiation? Um, there was mention of an undisclosed location an alternate location uh, besides the Tricon Church where um, a cell tower may be installed in town. I'd like to know what that undisclosed location is. Are citizens allowed to have public access to know the locations of 5G hardware in town and how do we go about that? 
My last question is, is minutes is off. Sorry. What's the process um, for approval? Is this something the school committee can uh, vote to approve or is it going to go to the town? And my other concern is about the potential of placing a tower near Walden Pond. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, we'll go back to comment in the room. Anyone else in the room for public comment? And I will go back online. If you'd like to make a public comment, use the raise hand feature and state your name and address. Aaron Fife. Hi, everyone. Um, Aaron Fife, 174 Hill Street in Concord. Um, I wanted to thank the superintendent for the email follow up about the um, incident with the Metco bus and the police being called last week. Um, I really appreciated um, further details and the acknowledgement that we have a lot of work to do still as a as a community school community and a larger community. I think it's really important to acknowledge when we can do better. Um, and that was the, the message that came through loud and clear. And I really appreciated that. Um, we're all still on this journey together. And these are the conversations we need to have to move ourselves forward. Um, I would also uh, take a moment to encourage the school committee um, when they start looking at policies again to think about the transportation policy. I was noticing that um, there's a lot of discrepancies in terms of the transportation policies um, sort of uh, student behavior and family expectations um, for Concord families that sort of get disseminated Concord families and then what is written down for Metco families. And I was wondering if this would be an opportunity to take a look at those policies, sort of compare and contrast how they're worded to try to sort of see if there's any kind of implicit biases that come through in what's highlighted, what's bolded, what's underlined, things like that. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of sort of extra things that need to go into the METCO policies because of the differing circumstances and the length of the drive and things like that. Um, but it might be a good opportunity just to take a, a closer look at that. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you. And any other public comment before we close up? Uh, yes, Elizabeth. Hi there, um, Elizabeth Frank, I'm at 1283 Elm Street. Um, and I also just um, wanted to second that appreciation of Dr. Hunter's second email to the community and just really appreciating <clears throat> the clarification that the students weren't at fault and that implicit racial bias was likely involved in the mistakes made by the adults. Um, at the same time, it doesn't lessen the pain and trauma that the children and families experienced. Um, and I'm just discouraged and angry and heartbroken that this happened. Uh, in our community. Um, and uh, in addition to uh, um, what Aaron suggested, I'd um, ask that additional DEI training be given to bus drivers um, and regular updates on DEI training, especially for those on the METCO um, routes. Um, and just to note that this incident, although it's a more public one, I think um, from what I've heard from friends in the community is, is only one example of the injustices that the black, black and brown students regularly face in our district. Um, and it really highlights the impact that implicit bias has on kids. Um, so I just ask that we all educate ourselves, um, me included, um, and work to dismantle any racial biases that have been passed down to us through our culture so that we can better serve all of our Concord students. Thank you. Thank you. All right, and anyone else? All right, we're gonna close up public comment. Thank you so much. And moving on to recognitions, we have CCHS math. And I think I saw Ms. Kieselbach here. You can come on over and join us at the table. I'm just gonna grab you at here. I'm gonna need somebody to help me share my screen. Okay. The magic of Erin at home. <laughs> yeah, Erin was gonna do it, I think, Sarah. Oh, she it. Yep, there's the magic. Yeah. It's just happening. <laughs> Do you want to sit? I'll, uh, um, I can, I'll stand over here. That's fine. Okay. You stand when you your microphone. Oh, I'll sit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you just verbally cue Aaron and she'll <laughs> move the so like slide. If I that she'll <laughs> or say next. <laughs> it's usually our there's fancy Aaron. word. There's Aaron. She there's said home. home. <laughs> I got it. Yeah. 
I'll just say next. It really is magic. It is magic. (laughs) Erin, I'll just say next when I'm ready. Okay, thank you. And Sarah Kiesebach is the department chair at CCHS of the math department. So thank you for joining us. Great. Well, um, thank you for making time in the agenda tonight for me to share some of the exciting and innovative things that we're doing in the math department. Um, This is exciting for me and my whole department on their behalf. Um, I could easily spend more than my 10 minute allotted 10 minutes, but I've timed myself nine minutes, 30 seconds. So I've got it. Um, (laughs) One of the biggest changes that really started last year for us um, in the department was our interest in Peter Lajladal's building thinking classrooms, teaching strategies and student learning opportunities. Um, We've participated. um, Thank you, Kristen, through the K through K through 12 paths this year, the PD workshop Um, with Peter. We were able to meet with him over Zoom. He lives in Canada and close to all of our teachers are utilizing a number of these practices that we value. Um, Next. All right, so to summarize some of the goals of the thinking classroom, the overriding philosophy and theme is that the classroom has shifted from a teacher-centered traditional lecture style experience to a student-centered experience where students are exploring concepts in a strategic format, but built on prior concepts and understanding while challenging each other in a collaborative and supportive environment. So in a nutshell, there's a lot more doing in this style of thinking classroom than what we are used to experiencing in a more traditional classroom. Next, please. So what are some of these changes that are taking place in our department? Um, If you were to walk into one of our thinking classrooms, these are some of the things that you would see. First and foremost, students are randomly put into groups of three, and that's very precise. Three is kind of like the magic number, according to Peter. Um, and, And we really do think that this is working in our department. So by doing this, students don't have the opportunity to place themselves into the category of being the smart one in the group or the low level student in the group or the student in the middle. So that randomization that we do, and most teachers do it daily, I do it daily. Um, We've really seen that they don't fall into those preconceived notions of of each other. Um, So randomizing the group increases the level of productivity of all students. Um, Students also work at vertical whiteboards and these are hung around the room. Um, This prevents some students from shying away and not participating. So we found overall much higher levels of participation amongst all of all of the students. We also do um, frequent mastery checks so that we can assess and the students can know how well they know a topic. We do this very regularly a few times each week. And then there's, of course, this is not really thinking classrooms, but a lot of the teachers are incorporating some fun and engaging online platforms. and I listed them there. So you can go back to this if you'd like to learn more about those. Next, please. Thank you. Um, so I'm gonna shift away now from discussing the thinking classrooms and share with you some of the other changes in the math department. Um, of course, in all situations, seeing finding the silver lining is important and albeit the pandemic was very challenging, it also gave us an opportunity to reflect on our priorities. So we've made a commitment in the math department to prioritize the mental health of our students while maintaining um, rigor. So what's the most important, what is the most stressful thing for students? Grades, right? Um, So I'm pleased to announce that all math teachers, and I do mean all, are rethinking the way they assess and have adopted some motivating assessment strategies, um, such as some of the ones that I've mentioned up here on the slide. So Um, Test quiz overrides, so we're focusing more on the summative assessments. They do better on a test than a quiz from the same unit. The quiz grade gets overridden by the test grade. Um, We do frequent assessing to allow students more opportunities to show mastery, which avoids the high stakes testing environment. Quiz retakes, Um, and another example is just checking for mastery, which is similar to homework, but it gives, again, students an idea of where they're at. Next, please. Okay, so in addition to these thinking classroom and assessment changes, I've included a few slides from a handful of our courses highlighting some ways in which they engage students. So this is from AP Statistics, an example that um, that teacher shared with me. They start each class with what he calls a thinking task. So 
This allows students to explore new ideas by applying existing knowledge in an engaging way. So this is an example of uh, a thinking task that's going to be generating conversation related to the law, law of large numbers. So you, you can think about that later. <laughs> uh, next, please. Okay, so another example is from our math fundamentals, which the teacher just calls it math fun. Um, they he he approaches this class in a very different way. They have a daily quiz um, or what he calls a check-in, which gives the students structure and repetition so that they build in skills and confidence. For those of you who don't know what math fundamentals is, it's for students who are um, two to three grade levels below the grade that they're in. So it's it's before um, algebra one. Next, please. All right, my last classroom example is from the standard statistics class, which is a course largely um, project-based. And what the teachers of this course are doing is, a, I thought this would be interesting for y'all tonight, um, a statistical analysis of data comparing the bud bursts, so that's when flowers first appear, between the 1800s and today. So in the 1850s, Henry Thoreau journaled about when different flowers bloomed. And then another famous naturalist, um, Hosmer, continued the data collection. Then there was a long gap, like 150 years, um, maybe not quite that, until Richard Premack, who is a professor at BU, began collecting this data, I think around 2000, 2001. And our data, our students are actually continuing this data collection from our CCHS native pollinator garden. So this is fantastic for them because they're seeing firsthand that the blueberries are flowering approximately two weeks earlier than in the mid 1800s. So it's pretty powerful to actually be a participant in that, right? Next. So I just wanna quickly mention a few other things before I wrap up the presentation. And I know that the calculus project was introduced to you all in the fall. Um, but it is something we're really excited about. So I felt it was important to mention to you again tonight that this program is something we are participating in with the goal of having more students of color reach AP statistics in high school. So I, I think these slides are shared with the school committee and the, the, I included a hyperlink. So if you'd like um, to learn more about the calculus project, if you didn't, if you weren't there in the fall, I embedded that link and we'll share it with you all. Um, I've also added... We've also added two new courses to our program of studies. One is which, which is called Geometry Essentials. And this is pretty exciting for us because it allows students an opportunity to get on that track to calculus who maybe weren't ready for that in middle school. So students who did not take Algebra 1 in middle school in eighth grade will still have an opportunity through um, this supplemental course called Geometry Essentials, which would allow them to get to calculus. So there, those are a couple of really exciting things that we're doing. Next. Okay, so our computer science teacher, and computer science is part of the math department, so I included this tonight, has set his goal this year to increase diversity in computer science and engineering courses at CCHS. He formed an ad hoc committee of math teachers, engineering teachers, and students to brainstorm ways to accomplish this. And in the late fall, he began posting slides around the CCHS monitors showing a diverse set of people that work in a variety of computer science and engineering jobs. And as students were starting to sign up for these courses, he recruited students, mostly girls, I had some come to my class, that's how I know, um, to tell other students about their experiences um, in person. And that was really powerful. Um, while we don't know for sure until the schedule is done, it looks like these efforts have yielded a lot of success. And I saw the preliminary schedule. It shows that his intro class uh, will be around 50% female, which is um, very different from previous years. So, okay. Next, please. So I just wanna put in a plug for the senior internship program at CC. It's not part of a specific department. Um, and so we think of it as like tangentially related to the math department because Lori Fortunato, a math teacher runs this. And it's really exciting. The students are doing incredible things. And so again, I sent, if you click on this picture, it's hyperlinked to her website so that you can see what types. And if you scroll down, you'll see there's about 15 students and each one of those students is a link to what their internship 
opportunity is. So I just invite you to um, check that out and see what the students are participating in. Some of them are really, really interesting. Next. Okay, so last but not least, I wanted to end the presentation with a slide containing some important data. So during the pandemic, the College Board did not omit topics from their AP courses, at least not from math. Um, and these are the scores from last year that we received in July. And so you can see the kids are rocking it. They, the average scores are well above Massachusetts and national averages. Uh, so we think we're really proud of this. And we think that, um, you know, the kids are doing a great job and um, demonstrating that through not just through AP scores, but in many ways, of course. Uh, so thank you for listening tonight. And if you have any questions, please reach out to me via email and I'd be happy to correspond with you. Thanks. Thank you so much. Sorry, you might want to stay and I have a question. Oh, sure, yeah. Yes. <clears throat> All right. Any questions? Can I ask a question? Yes, go of ahead. Of course. Mm -hmm. I was assuming that mastery checks were kind of like synonyms for quizzes, but that seems to maybe not be the case. What is the difference, for example, between like a quiz and a mastery check? So when when I think of quiz, I think um, it's an assessment that would count towards your grade. Their grade that's part of their test grade. Yeah. Or assessment grade. So a mastery check is more like a check-in um, that doesn't, there's no points attached to it. Does it, it just gives them a sense of where they are? Like a quiz, but it just isn't. The question really is, will you see a mastery check in Aspen? <laughs> no, no, no. It actually is. is it? It? No, oh, no, sorry, no. Sorry, like, sorry. I had liked what you said about um, like the fundamentals class where there's like an expectation of a daily quiz or it, you know, it just, it creates structure and the ability for the kids to plan. And I was thinking like, is a mastery check sort of like that, like an ungraded quiz? So think of it as a, as a quiz that needs to be passed, but they get an unlimited number of chances to take it. Okay, so typically mastery checks are done um, following homeworks and the, and on the mastery check, the, the problems will be similar to what they would have seen in the homework. So it's just a check-in to see if they understand it. And they do that once in class. If they don't pass it, yeah. they have to come back. It's usually during one of like their lunch the next day or a free block. Maybe flex block, maybe next flex year. Flex block, something like that. Yeah, that, that would be a good idea for sure. And so they come back and they, and they try it again. If they don't pass it again, they do it the next day. Great. So they basically are required to gain that mastery. Wonderful. But it's Great. not attached to grades and like a No, test. that's exactly yes. what I was curious about. You nailed it. Great. And I think that's definitely a departure. Like even the fact that you can have retakes on quizzes and tests, that was not always the case a few True. years ago. So so that's really that's great. Yeah. And I think what's exciting, you know, I showed the the data from the AP scores and that that does speak volumes. Um, but the kids seem happier, you know, I mean, I've taught on, I'm teaching honest geometry this year. It's probably my 10th year teaching it. And the kids are still being assessed on really hard problems. Um, yet they seem happier and there's more motivation. There's hope, right? So I do the test quiz override. That was my contribution to that list. And, you know, I just gave a quiz the other day and some students weren't thrilled with it and they turned it in. They're like, I'm going to learn from my mistakes. And then typically the score on the test is much higher, right? That's the whole purpose of a formative assessment is to figure out what your strengths and weaknesses are. Um, and then the summative is where they can demonstrate that they've gained that mastery. So, great. Any other questions? Can you talk a little bit about the process by which you brought in the uh, randomized trios and the fact that they're uh, thinking out loud with each other? What was, the, so, what was the transition like for students and teachers? Was it almost implicitly expected and quick, or did it take a lot of introduction? How did that roll out? The randomizing is pretty quick and easy. It was a little strange at the beginning of the year because I, I implemented that this year. And um, they're like, really randomized seating again? And I said, no, we're just gonna, I'm just going to click this button, and the seating chart's going to be displayed at the front of the room. You're going to find your new seat every day. So that that, that took a couple days to get used to. Um, the vertical whiteboards it was much, is much harder for them. Um, it's tiring because they're thinking a lot more. You know, if you're if you're at a table with three people, somebody is usually take charge and doing a lot of the work. But if you're displayed and your your work is displayed and your person is displayed, you can't hide. And you have to be a contributor. So I asked my students, and I have asked former students who 
aren't my current students, so they have no reason to tell me one thing or another, um, how that experience has gone. And they say, it's very tiring. I asked them at the beginning of the year, this is just anecdotal. And they're like, oh, I don't know if we like it. It's so much work, you know, but they're because they're they're thinking a lot more. And then I asked them just out of curiosity, I saw a couple of my seniors, they just took the AP yesterday, Monday. Um, in calculus. So I had them last year in pre-calc and they said, oh yeah, we got, we got more, much more used to it. So I think it's like anything you sort of build up an endurance and you know, they've gotten used to it. My students like it a lot. Um, it gives them an opportunity. It's almost like a competition too, because they can see everybody's work. Yeah. So Ed, I would say overall, those sort of basic building thinking classroom strategies have, um, it's been pretty seamless to be honest. That's great. I mean, because you think of like math as math, but this really is different. This is a different way of teaching math. So it's a very different way. And it builds in a lot of opportunity for differentiation mm -hmm. because kids can go at different pa um, paces. You know, you, there's a lot of opportunities for the, for a teacher to build that in, but the collaborative nature, like it's, it's right, you know, increasing the level for all of the students. So we're seeing some good things. And I think many of the Christian, the middle school teachers have adopted this. Yep, a few well. elementary school teachers and most of the middle school. And tomorrow I have three teachers visiting from AB um, who are coming to, to observe some classes and learn more about that as well. That's great. Thank you so much for coming. This is exciting, You're welcome. exciting stuff and it's exciting to have other teachers come into our district to really learn from us. So well, it's fun to share because it is, it is um, you know, exciting to, to let you all know what we're doing and what we're up to. You're good. Okay. Thanks, Thank, you. Thank you. You too. All right. And we are back to a reading of the minutes. So you should have received the March 14th, March 28th, March 11th, and I'm sorry, April 11th and April 12th minutes from Erin. Anyone have any changes or additions, corrections? I looked them over. I they were excellent. They were excellent. I think I, I had made one name change on one of the minutes. I think that was it. So I think we're good. Do we need to note that here or was it already? Uh, I think she had already corrected it and resent it. So I think we're good. All right. So I would take a motion to approve the minutes of March 14th, March 28th, April 11th, and April 12th. So moved. You have a second? Second. Any more discussion? No. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. And on to correspondence. So I'm going to start with you, Alexa, for CPS. Sure. And Concord Pop-Up, we had two pieces of correspondence. One was um, from an eighth grader. Uh, they're kicking off their civics project. I hope this is the first of many pieces of correspondence we sometimes get at this time of year. <laughs> um, and the other one was, oh, um, about the... Hold on. I did it. I saw it. I had it. Just had it up. Sorry. Um, the other one was about the cell phone tower. No. No. It, uh, oh, it came today. That's why. Um, was it from Kristen Higgity? Yes. Uh, yeah. Oh, just thanking us uh, for uh, the correspondence on um, the incident on the bus. And at the region, um, we had three emails on embedded, embedded English at the high school. And then we had one on a cell phone tower, which I forwarded to you today, which was a link um, to a study. So you can take a look at that. And that's all we had for this week. And then we'll go on to chairs and superintendent's report. So Dr. Hunter, I'll start with you. Yeah, and I'm going to be brief tonight because there's so much other great information coming to you. Um, I just want to publicly note that Justin Sparks has been hired as the Rose next principal. Justin's coming to us from uh, Fitchburg, where he's already a sitting principal and bringing a lot of great ideas and thoughts and people skills. And we're just really excited to welcome him. So he'll start July 1st and do a little transitioning before then, including coming to one of our meetings before the year is out. Um, otherwise, it's just really, really busy. It's spring. So we are enjoying all of the rich activities that happen as the year starts to close and engaging in all of those and half a foot into next year with all the hiring that we're doing, schedules that we're building, planning, and um, really setting the year up for success. I think we, this morning, 
morning, we spent quite a bit of time in the strategic plan and fine tuning metrics and rolling that into school improvement plans that are going to come to you. And that then rolls into where the PD time is going to go. And it just all feels really correlated and synchronized and all going in the same really strong direction. So more to come on all of that, but we're working really um, effectively on all of that. And that's thanks to the collaboration of the community and the committee and everyone involved. So it's a really busy time. You're going to hear a lot of all the work that's going on and events as they happen. Great. Right. Um, and then last night, uh, Lori, Bob, and I went to a Carlisle Town meeting. It's very exciting over in Carlisle. Um, there were no questions about the regional budget at all, and it passed <laughs> really quickly, which was great. Um, and as you know, there's a significant change in the assessment to Carlisle for next year. So they were well planned for that. So thank you to Carlisle. Do you have anything else? We're good. All right. Perfect. And moving on, we're just going to keep going. We have a special education update tonight, and I see Deb Dixon is with us. She brought a big team from the high school. I don't know if you want to introduce or if you want me to. It's really up to you. Are you going to bring everybody up with you? or? I'm going to start by myself. and then Perfect. All right. Well, welcome. Come on up. <laughs> and I think this is the last time you'll be with us this year, right? And so, so and that means ever, ever. So thank you so much for being with us these past two years. Lots of changes have happened and you've certainly, I think someone said it the other day, this, you left it better than when you came. So, you know, it's been, it's been really great having you with us. A pleasure. So unlike previous meetings, um, my part is very short and I will try to keep to my time here. Um, so this is my last special ed update. Erin, um, you can go to the next slide. And I just wanted to start by updating you with some facts and figures um, about where we are. The um, This information that you see on this slide is from the March 1st um, SIMS data collection. And I think what's um, very interesting is that, as you can see, the the current numbers or the March 1 numbers are in red, and the previous October numbers are in parentheses next to these figures. And there's been pretty significant increase um, in many areas over the course of this year as we're evaluating students and students are coming on IEPs, and most notably, um, we're seeing the increase in autism, emotional, and communication. Um, the other areas have had moderate or minor uh, increases and or decreases. Um, next slide. This, once again, you've seen the slide before, but this is a comparison of our headcounts for um, the schools from last June to the October count to the latest March head count. And our numbers are here staying relatively um, the same and the percentages are basically the same. And I think we're in keeping with the state average, which is around 17%. And for those who um, don't know, the itinerant number, number is for students who may be um, either homeschooled or privately placed um, at private expense, but they access services in the school. So they come in. It could, it, most of the time, it's um, a preschooler who may come in um, for speech and language therapy only. They're not actually participating in the preschool program here, but come in for direct service. Um, next slide. This is a slide that I have not shared with you before, but I thought it was interesting and timely. Um, one of the pieces of information that DESI collects is regarding our placement patterns of students who are on IEPs. And what you can see here, and this is just for in-district students, what you can see is that we, um, the vast majority of our students at both all um, elementary, middle school, and high school are considered full inclusion students, um, which means they're pulled out of the gen ed classroom for less than 21% of the time. Um, and the numbers drop dramatically when we look at partial inclusion 
which is pull out from between 21 and 60 percent of the time, and sub-separate, which is um, being pulled out and taught in a sub substantially separate setting more than 60 percent of their day. Um, next slide. So this, you've seen this before, um, and once again, we're very proud of the continuum of service that we've been able to complete. Um, this is um, a time for me to thank, actually, actually thank you all for your commitment and support in the development and completion of this continuum um, with the funding and addition of staff that was required to um, create these programs and this continuum. Um, we are thrilled that this all of these programs are in place um, for the students of Concord and Concord Carlisle. I think that it, for the near future, I feel that special education is appropriately staffed um, with our programs. And the next step and the next focus will be more on consultation with specialists, pro professional development, and um, training, professional development and training of the staff involved in these programs. And that includes both special education staff and general ed staff um, to support these programs. So I'm hoping that there's not a need to come back for more staff requests, but it's more focused on professional development to support the programs and enhance the programs. At the last meeting that I attended and presented at, um, I was asked to highlight um, what's happening at the high school. So the next part of this presentation is specifically for the high school. And um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce some folks now. Um, so you all can, can actually join me here. Um, Tom Keene is our Pathways teacher at the high school, has been here for many years and grown the program to what it is today. Awesome, chairs. And I, I can... Sure, sit in the back. Courtney Lada is special ed teacher um, working in the Harbor program. Erin Pino is the department chair this year and is also a learning or academic support under teacher. And then, and lastly, Fran, Fran Wolf is the high school special ed administrator. And they are going to tell you everything you ever wanted to know about um, the high school programs. You know, I'm gonna actually give you a microphone. Okay, yeah, so hopefully, just use the mm -hmm. microphone. You can pass it. I hope this will work. If not, they'll come up and they'll tell me it's not working. Seems like we need to think it through. Close first. Mm -hmm. Okay, now. All right. Hello, everyone. It's going. It's not going to sound okay. like it's working, okay. but it's actually working. Okay, great. Thank you. <laughs> Um, so I'm here with my some of my talented staff talking about special education at our high school. Um, and the next slide, we're going to start with eighth to ninth grade transition, um, which we are working on and have been working on since the fall. Um, we work with Carlisle Middle School and Concord Middle School, as well as um, many private schools that um, end their programming in eighth grade um, and parents are looking to um, bring their children back to the public schools. Um, so we start having transition nights and we start coordinating with um, guidance counselors, special education staff. Um, we have visits where they come and tour our building and see our programs. Um, and we go to their um, buildings and see their programs. So that has been going um, ongoing and is still happening now. Next slide. And the first one, I'm gonna give this to Erin. Um, it's gonna talk about uh, ninth grade academic academy. Um, so this is just a slide that we, um, present when we do this presentation for um, upcoming middle school students. Um, and it just is a way to reinforce for families, students, parents, that um, the special ed department is connected to the ninth grade academy, um, which I'm sure you've all heard about, and um, that we have um, 
we have academic supports, which there's a slide coming up in a little bit that will um, describe how we as a special ed department support the transition as well. So next slide, please. Um, the goal of the ninth grade academy is to create an emotionally healthy, socially inclusive, and academically supportive first year experience for ninth grade students. It's done through a team model with um, core academic classes. Next slide. Um, in addition to the special education programs that we'll talk about in just a few minutes, um, the high school is committed to providing support for all students, and some of these are um, in academic support programs, branches specifically for ninth graders. CERC is a more humanities-based um, academic support, and it's for all students. Um, the MARC focuses on math. We have challenge for students with um, attendance difficulties. Um, in 10th grade, we have a two time a week English seminar that helps strengthen um, literacy skills for the MCAS. And then finally, we offer a homework club Monday through Thursday. It's staffed by two tutors from the special education department, but it is a, um, it's a support that's open to everybody. Oh, next. next, I keep starting. Um, and then all of the special education services that we're about to discuss are determined by each student's current team. So for the eighth graders, it's determined at the middle school with consultation from the high school staffing. And then up here, it will be your students, current case manager, guidance counselor, and academic teachers. And so our ninth grade academic support class is a, it's a class for students um, in special education and it dovetails really nicely with the ninth grade academy. Um, we were finding that students that were coming in, ninth graders that were coming in needed support across all three areas listed at the bottom, executive functioning, academic strategies, and literacy skills. And so we created these support blocks. It's only ninth graders in the program and it is completely focused on um, helping them transition, providing that extra support that they may need and teaching them how to take the um, skills and strategies that they have and apply them to their core academic classes. Next slide. So after ninth, um, ninth grade academic support, we um, are we have two big academic support study skills classes. One is more literacy based, and one is more executive functioning based. So RAP is our literacy based program. It stands for writing, reading, and academic processes. Um, so the focus in here is really strengthening and developing reading comprehension and written expression skills but teaching them how to explicitly use them in their core academic classes. We also cover things like note-taking, test preparation, um, test-taking skills, general executive functioning, and then we're always working with the students to help them understand where they are at and how to advocate for their needs. And then next slide. Our other major academic support program is our LEAP program, which stands for Learning Executive and Academic Processes. So this program is focused more on um, goal setting, organizing tasks, time management, task management, planning and prioritization, um, and study skills, memory strategies, um, and the reason why these last two programs are 10 through 12 is because we wanted to have an opportunity as the staff that works with them at the high school to determine where these 
students should end up. So after they come out of the ninth grade academic support, the teachers who have worked with them in that program determine which of the these two programs um, students would go to next. Okay, next slide. So the bridge program is for grades nine through 12 um, for students that are on the autism spectrum disorder or have um, social communication difficulties staffed by special education teachers, school psychologists, speech pathologists, transition specialists, and tutors. Um, it's an inclusion program, which means that all the students go into the general education um, classes, some with tutor support, some without, um, but they have a home base where they get their study skills and they get social pragmatics um, and social skills training by um, the people listed under the staffing. Um, and they work also um, things like executive functioning as well. Um, and they do that in the bridge classroom and they have a lot of consultation time with the general education teachers to support them. Um, and the, the children are very success, successful with accessing the um, curriculum with um, help and, you know, uh, they are able to really shine with, um, with tutor support. And we noticed that as, you know, they start in ninth grade, maybe needing more tutor support. Um, and by 11th grade, really um, scaling that back. And by their senior year, most of them are um, not supported by tutors in the classroom. There are some that still are. But really the goal is for um, independence and generalizing the skills that they have learned um, in previous years. Next slide. And I think the next slide actually outlines what Fran just said. Okay, yep, next slide. Mm -hmm. Okay, next. Okay. Um, literacy and uh, beyond, which is our new um, lab program that was just it just started in September. We started to pilot it unofficially um, last January um, with the first cohort. Um, and this is staffed by two special education teachers, um, tutors, and we have partner teachers. We get um, outside support and consultation from Landmark Outreach. It's also supported by school psychologists and a speech pathologist. Next slide. And um, in the lab program, we work on um, the language and literacy skills, executive functioning, um, social emotional development, and there are uh, lots of co-taught classes and supported content classes. Again, this is another program that is more heavily supported in ninth grade. Um, and a little bit of a release in 10th grade and um, mostly independent by 11th and 12th grade. Next slide. And Courtney Ladd is gonna talk about Anchor. Hi everybody, my name is Courtney Latta and thank you for this opportunity to speak tonight. Um, we are very excited to merge Harbor and Ultpro. Um, so this is my second year at CCHS, and I've been the Harbor teacher, and next year we are going to combine forces, um, and so that we have one continuum of services um, and a, a really strong team to support the needs of our students. So this continuum of, continuum of social, emotional, and academic supports um, we'll use to address student well-being for students who have an emotional disability. So our staff includes two special education teachers, myself um, and another special education teacher. Um, two mental health professionals will be on staff with us um, all the time, a school psychologist and also a licensed mental health counselor. Um, and we have general ed co-teachers and a transition specialist, all of which will come into our space and work with us and the students. Um, in addition to um, plenty of tutors on staff. And I think, the best part of this program is that it provides a feature of security for our students 
and our students will uh, benefit from a strong relationship with all of the staff that we have within the program. Next slide. <clears throat> And specialized instruction, what we'll be doing in here, we focus a lot on self-regulation and coping skills. We are basing a lot of what we do in DBT work and mindfulness and things of that nature, while also, also of course, focusing on our academic and executive functioning needs. Um, we will have some separate content areas available for our students, math, English, and social studies. So should students need a little bit more support, we'll have that available within our program. But then as students continue to progress and grow in their skill set, we'll be able to support them as they are, you know, um, transitioning maybe back into a general ed classroom. Um, and of course, we will have our crisis management and response on the ready for our students who may need it. Next. Hi, everybody. I'm Tom Keen. I work in the Pathways Program. And um, the Pathways Program was created in 1999 as a direct result of federal legislation, the IDEA Individuals with Disability Act 1997, which really uh, prompted school districts to look at inclusion and bring students with um, more significant needs back to the district. Um, since then, we've evolved over the years. Uh, in 19, uh, I mean, in 2019, we created the launch program, which broke up uh, pathways from uh, a 14 to 22 to a 14 to 18, and launch, which we'll talk about in a minute, is from 18 to 22. Okay, so in terms of pathways, we look at it from a three prong approach academics, social, and pre vocational. The academics piece is a combination of looking at a student's individual needs really trying to figure out, um, do they need skills-based remediation courses, which could be functional uh, ELA, math, life skills, and more importantly, how do we support them in an inclusion environment? And the inclusion classes could be planet Earth and biology, but we also look at students' um, backgrounds. For example, next year, I'm going to have a student from the Pathways Program uh, take French one, and I've been collaborating with Caitlin Smith um, because we really want to support uh, the students' skills, abilities, and most importantly, their interests. So in Pathways, we have an eclectic range of staff members from special ed teachers to speech and language pathologists, transition specialists, school psychologists, and tutors. Um, this past year, um, under Aaron, Brand, and Deb's leadership, we created a, a, a bigger affinity program where we're actually having students from outside the district come in. And that's created a wonderful opportunity to uh, grow the program. Um, and also it, it works to support the students from a co-curricular standpoint. Now we have uh, students um, playing unified basketball. We have students, uh, we just finished up our track season today. We had our uh, end of the season banquet, uh, unified track, but also the co-curriculars give students that opportunity to, uh, to try other uh, opportunities, whether it's the school musical, uh, this year, for the first time, we had a student participate in the downhill ski team, uh, which was uh, magnificent from an inclusion standpoint. Um, so uh, it's, it's really that blend of helping these students become the most productive citizens they possibly can before they transition out. Next uh, slide, please. And here's a sample of uh, some of the supports uh, from vocational programming. During uh, the COVID time, we've had the opportunity to support the help office, where um, my students would deliver supplies to the elementary and middle and preschool. And if you think about that, what an awesome opportunity to have unscripted social uh, opportunities coming in, greeting people um, unrehearsed, and the students really enjoyed it. They understood the, the importance of their role. Um, from an academic support standpoint, uh, the students received support during the school day as well as um, uh, after school. Uh, and in terms of vocational counseling, we really look at how do we support a student from a um, vocational development or three critical vocational behaviors, which are um, career investigation, career acquisition, and most importantly, career retention. And it all ties back to that social piece that I mentioned earlier. And the social piece is carried out by not only a speech language pathologist working on the pragmatics, but uh, having a school psychologist really 
breaking down social interactions that may have happened. I think every Friday last block, Jenna Caruso, our school psychologist, runs um, a, a, a group that I am fortunate to be a part of. And they really talk about the week, but also talk they talk about the weekend because we understand the importance of um, um, thinking about school, not just from a uh, eight o'clock to 2.41, but more of a holistic approach. And uh, as you can see, this is a picture from our unified game, uh, Acton Boxborough, we played them this fall. And at the end of the game, they shared uh, posters welcoming us. I mean, tell me that is an inclusion in a nutshell there. And that's, uh, that's just a phenomenal picture. Um, maybe the next slide, would you like me to talk about lunch? Yes. Okay. Next slide, please. Okay, so the launch program, as I mentioned, um, was created in September of 2019 through Dr. Hunter's uh, initiative. And it really gave the students an opportunity to identify themselves as um, students that are looking for not only vocational um, opportunities, but post-secondary. And that's uh, so powerful because as we know, that legislation was just passed in July talking about uh, post-secondary opportunities for students with intellectual um, disabilities. So the launch program uses Ripley as truly a launch pad. The students go out to um, uh, vocational opportunities, whether it's competitive employment, whether it's volunteering, um, we can't emphasize the concept of service enough, um, but also we, with Radka Grine and Mary Desmond really taking the helm at working with students. We have a lot of students taking courses at um, Middlesex Community College, and uh, it's just an exciting program. And, uh, and I know the staff at Ripley love having the launch students there because um, um, they're there as a, a real entity. They're, they're part of the uh, Ripley community day in and day out. And, uh, and it's really nice when I get to come over and see the interactions taking place. They're truly authentic. Let's watch the presentation. There's Did a short clip. Yeah, okay. I think there's a short clip. Okay. It's just three minutes. So that this is a presentation that was um, written and um, designed by the launch program students. Is there audio? Sometimes we struggle. With it. <laughs> so you can see they have lots of fun at lunch um, it's always a great place to um, stop by and see some smiles and see some great learning going on um, in the community and um, in the building itself and then we have math services for um, all the special education students um, that have math goals on their IEPs that um, go and get special education help from special education teachers, also um, general education math teachers and math tutors that are um, assigned to the um, resource center, as well as next slide. There's also reading skills. go. Um, it's a skills-based class that focus, focuses on the um, 
the reading that needs to happen so that kids can um, really access their curriculum. Uh, fluency, comprehension, um, writing and grammar, and that is taught by a special education teacher as well. Next slide. And we have a transition um, specialist, which has been mentioned in many of the programs. So she is very busy. She supports um, a lot of students in our high school. Um, she traditionally, the position was supporting um, kind of just pathways and launch prior to last year. Um, and we really changed what the job description was and broadened um, her reach, realizing that um, she could definitely be used in other areas as well. So she goes into our um, SE programs and supports in there as well, um, teaching a transition seminar class, as well as other um, students that are in um, CCHS as well. Next slide. And these are all our um, related service providers that we have at the high school that are available depending on the student's needs. And lastly, next slide. A big thank you for <laughs> hearing about all our great programming and um, we appreciate your support. Thank you. Nice, thank you. Wow, that I mean, that's really excellent. I have to credit Debbie too with getting all of the program descriptions on our website. So for all our viewers at home, if you want to see every program we have to offer here, they all are on the website, which has been a really great addition and a great resource for parents, um, you know, of kids with special needs. So I'll open it up to anyone at the table for any questions that you might have for our great group of educators here. Carrie, yeah. Um, I have a couple of questions. I also, so first, Debbie, thank you so much. I know it's your last meeting. You've been such an incredible resource for this community. Um, and I feel like every time I've heard you speak, which isn't incredible amount, but like you are so steady and just <laughs> even keeled. And I think that that is just brings such a calming presence. Um, so you inspire a lot of confidence and you have helped a lot of people. So thank you very much. Um, I, I had a couple of questions on this. Um, I know this was mostly focused on high school, but on the Sims data page, was that K through 12? So that was the data that was the increase or the numbers of students who are, um, who have IEPs or what is that K through 12? I think it's pre-K through 12, pre -K through 12. Maybe, may also include out of district. Okay. So, what, what so the numbers don't necessarily match on from one slide to another because the, of the way that Desi provides us with the information. Okay. I guess I was just wondering in some of these, like some of these jumps, as you indicated, are pretty drastic. Um, are, are you seeing that across the board? Like, is it evenly distributed amongst, you know, K pre-K through 22? Or is, are you seeing that mostly at the elementary level? And, and what do you attribute it to? Um, so I think that one, one of the things I think we're seeing it across the board. Okay. Um, we seem to um, invite a lot of move-ins. Mm -hmm. There's been an extraordinary number of children moving in with IEPs, um, and it seems that many are moving in for our. They're very knowledgeable about our programs, says, yeah. in spite of it not being on the website <laughs> yet. But <laughs> they all know about um, it. <laughs> so that I think is one one factor. The other piece that I do believe is that our teachers are um, completing more thorough and comprehensive evaluations and changing um, disability categories. Mm -hmm. We have mentioned a while ago that um, neurological was one of the higher, um, most identified categories of disability. And I think that in digging deeper through evaluation, that number is shift going down and the um, students are being identified with specific learning disabilities more so, it's hard to tease out sometimes. Um, but I think the teams are doing more of that. That And I think that shifts the numbers somewhat. Got it. Um, and the, the, again, students with um, ages three to nine are can be classified as developmentally delayed to catch all. And once they turn nine, they then have to be identified in one of the other categories. 
Okay. So I think there are a lot of factors. So do you see jumps like this typically? I'm wondering, like, is there a, is this like a COVID things have gone undetected piece or? Um... I think the, the increase in the emotional disabilities um, yeah. is rampant across the country. Mm -hmm. We're all hearing about the mental health needs um, that are, that we're facing right now. So I think that's part of it. And I do believe that's very much COVID related. I think there was um, a slowdown during the COVID period where students weren't getting evaluated. Mm -hmm. And then there's been an uptick um, that we experienced last year and this year. The other thing that happens is that the cycle of reevaluation, which occurs every three years, is coming due in the next couple of years. So we're dealing with that as well. And I, one of my other questions, I have um, one, I was, went back and looked at your October presentation and you you talked about, um, you gave a lot of like beginning of the year, end of year data. Is it too soon for some of that achievement data? Um, I think it was MCAS um, and I think it might've just been MCAS, but um, just at where, where kids with um, disabilities are compared to like at the state level and compared to their peers. They're still taking yeah, they, yes, now. Yeah, okay, so it's just too soon. Yeah. Okay, so mm -hmm. probably in the fall for the, okay. Yeah, they're literally taking, taking them the now. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> there's no new data yet. <laughs> um, and then I just, my last comment, I, I love the focus on um, inclusion wherever possible. Um, I think that it speaks to our values as a community and as a district, and um, it's really apparent in how you all are talking about these services too. So obviously there are instances where that's not possible, but um, I love this I love this focus on um, trying to keep kids in their community schools and with their peers as much as possible. So thanks. Teachers, you. The teachers here are phenomenal, mm -hmm. um, both general ed and special ed, and embrace the notion of inclusion. Mm -hmm. And um, we continue to say inclusion isn't a place or a location, it's a belief system. And we just need to continue to promote that belief system here and support the teachers who work with our kiddos. Mm -hmm. There's some prom attendees, right, from Pathways? Yeah. Yeah. Exciting. That's awesome. Yeah. I have a couple of questions. Um, first, I'll echo Carrie's sentiments. Um, I, as someone who has observed and liaised with the um, CPAC community, what you have brought in these past two years is exceptional and extraordinary, and I do appreciate that. I certainly wouldn't want to speak for those parents, but you know, even just as an observer, I've seen such a difference. Um, in what is shared with the community, both both the CPAC community and in our little micro community here at the school committee and, and how it's communicated. And um, we, I think I, I really appreciate that. My question, um, same data set that Carrie's looking at, the, obviously the increases are remarkable. Um, when I look at specifically um, the autism spectrum disorder jump that obviously is, I think the big one that kind of is not just remarkable, but extraordinary. Um, and I have heard um, their anecdotes, I understand that, but um, several people who um, sell homes in the area have been talking to me about how um, people are coming in and saying, you know, from Texas, from California, my advocate recommended this town specifically for this program. I mean, and so I'm talking about people, this is not like someone from Bedford and someone from, um, you know, I don't even know, Bill Rick or whatever. This, this, this is interstate kind of something like, can we continue to scale this um, if we are becoming like nationally known? Is there a limit to the capacity that we can take on like how it's it's such a fascinating i don't know that it's a problem yet but it could be i don't know can it, could, a i guess could it become a problem and and how how do we scale it is there even an answer to that nope okay great <laughs> if you build it they will come. Say, well but we have built it and ha and they are coming and so you know it's interesting to me I, it speaks incredibly well to the mm -hmm. program, I think. This is, um, I've experienced this in other districts yeah. as well. So I don't think it's just Concord. Um, 
going back like many years, realtors were trying to sell homes in a previous community that I was in, um, actually several, and they use the school system. Um, I actually believe that the special education is only as good as the gen ed program. Mm -hmm. And Concord and Concord Carlisle have very rich and robust, strong, exemplary academic programs. And I think that's the first draw. Mm -hmm. And then secondly, the special ed is an extension of the, the general ed program. Um, there are some families, though, who have very specific needs or children with specific needs who do shop around. Um, we get inquiries all the time. Like I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of moving to Concord. My child has an IEP for X. You know, can you tell me about the programs? Um, and they're doing that to every single community in, mm. in, in Metro West. So um, I, I know that it happens. I don't, I think it's been happening for a very long time. I don't know that it will tip the scales and yeah. I don't know what we can do about it. If a family moves here and has a student with a need, we must and we will provide. And I even just think about physical space. You know, I, it's it's interesting. It's, it is. It is. I will, if I could just add to that, yeah. it's also interesting. There's also been a handful of families who didn't even know those programs existed when they moved into Concord and were really surprised and thrilled that we had a really strong service delivery for their child. So it's a mix of both. And then we pulled the data because we were all intrigued by this. And it was only 11% of the people that actually moved in like over a right, school of year. It is the draw of the entirety of the school district, mm -hmm. I think, first and foremost, and yes, certainly some parents really advocate for their child and know what they're looking for and what IEP needs they have. And then there's some who just come here for other reasons. Mm -hmm. um, we had some move out of the Air Force Base and they landed in Concord sort of coincidentally and were thrilled we were going to be able to keep their child in district. So it's a little bit of everything. I tend to agree with Debbie. I, I don't expect it to balloon so fast. We can't accommodate as things things roll and remember there's always kids rolling up or rolling off or rolling out so um i just yeah. want to piggyback off that I, I know the numbers are startling when you look at them but it doesn't mean that every one of those numbers they need um you know full support right. that's mm -hmm. substantially separate S some of those numbers are um complete inclusionary um right that um, the resources are not a huge drain on our staff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's it's not as if, you know, we're talking about, you know, putting wings on buildings. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I just, yeah. And I imagine this dovetails with what you're seeing nationally mm -hmm. with the, the increases. I, I think so. Yes. Yeah. 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 I'm done. Okay. I think we've, uh, Sarah or Sharon, Sarah? Sarah. you're up. I do have a couple of questions. Um, as Carlisle families transition to Concord, um, how do they find out about your CPAC meetings and to, to learn more about your programs? I think I looked on the website, I didn't see anything. How can we uh, help Carlisle families with that information? We do do a lot of work with um the special ed department in Carlisle, as Fran mentioned earlier, it starts early and the contact is is frequent and often. And we do um, then offer orientation meetings. Um, we, we had several, both Zoom and in person for Carlisle families. Um, in terms of how they get involved with CPAC, I think CPAC will tell you later when they present. Okay. Um, but there, we we were told last year that we weren't communicating well enough with um or I think when I at the beginning of last year that we were asked to really communicate with Carlisle and include them in the process and we've tried to do that over the past two years and and there are things that happen like you do I'm assuming you do transition meetings just like at CMS you go over to Carlisle and do those transition meetings at IEP and yeah. has participated in many, many, yeah. many transitions. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, so that's good. That. Um, yeah. So, and we yeah. also, I went there uh, back in January, February, and they had a transition meeting in their auditorium that I was present along with um, 
the two co-principals. So we're we're visible there. Good. And just one more question. I think I heard decoding when we were talking about literacy. Is that something that we use um, still? Because I think it was mostly around high school data. Is that something that, there are that some we're kids, utilizing at the high school level? Yeah, there still? are some kids that um, have the services of, of reading, whether it be like a Wilson program or um, something of that nature that they are sort of working on reading. Oh, skills. can you use the wireless mic? Sorry. There we go. Thank you. So they, they are still, um, you know, significantly behind grade level in reading. Um, not many, but there are a handful that still get that service. Yes. Sarah? Yeah. Sort of follow up on a, some more about the, the literacy stuff. So the, the lab that started piloted last year started officially this year. It, that sort of grew out of a lot of your work with Landmark. Is that true? Or it just happened to coincide with the work with, it, it, with Landmark or Landmark? So we, we identified a need mm -hmm. in our students. Um, we have students with language-based learning disabilities and dyslexia. Um, many families felt that they that we were not able to meet their needs um and would potentially um go out of district to places like Carroll School, Wyndham Woods, Landmark type programs. Um, we had services at each of our buildings, but we didn't have a program per se. So we indicated it indicated that we needed to grow our program and, and become a little bit more structured and focused. And that's what we did. And we created the lab program. Because of that, we then um, engaged with Landmark Outreach to act as the ongoing consultant okay. with our um, teachers, both gen ed and special ed who are affiliated with the program. So the stuff with land, it's it wasn't a one and done. It's an ongoing just it needs to be like ongoing. as needed yeah. kind of support. Okay, yeah. that, that's great. Um, and then I have a question about the you were said mentioned. I think that teachers and just building building based people are getting better at honing in on what the specific um, needs are of the students. I wonder in Carlisle we've seen some interesting trends in the past few years in terms of how evaluations are sort of initiated, whether they're initiated from the school or from parents and and trends that correlate to that. I'm just wondering if you've seen any remarkable changes um, in, in, in that, not any specific numbers, but um, I, think, I think the takeaway from, if I'm understanding, is sort of the teacher initiated ones have gotten much, more, um, I think to your point, like more specific, more more identifying the needs. Um, and I think that the a lot of the parent ones, there are a lot of gross concerns um, that I think get alleviated through these evaluations that that they're not. I think there used to be more balance between when when a teacher and when a parent um, brought them brought a concern forward. And I think there's a divergence in Carlisle there. So. I I think we're seeing the same thing, mm -hmm. um, and you can speak to the high school, but uh, parent referrals, um, we might get more parent referrals, mm -hmm. um, but we fi have more findings of no eligibility. Um, and the school-based referrals that come out of the child study team or teacher assistance team um, are often, those kiddos are, mm -hmm. yeah. So that speaks to yeah. the ability of the classroom teachers um, and the teams at the school, the gen ed te teams, um, to identify children who, who whose needs cannot be met through MTSS and other interventions and really need more. And there, we then are able to evaluate um, per law. We have to evaluate in areas of suspected disability. And we are doing comprehensive evaluations. Well, and I think the fact that the numbers are going up means that you guys are like that, that, that when needs when needs are there, they are. They are identified, right? Yeah. They are. Uh, it's, it's not a it's not a way of massaging out. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I can speak to the the um, numbers in emotional um, mm -hmm. disability and the jump there. So, about eighty to eighty five percent of the initial evaluations this year, the concern was uh, emotional. So, um, and with that. Um, the majority of those students are being found eligible. And so even the emotional ones are mostly coming from the school more than 
-hmm. they're coming from both they're coming from a mix but it's um it, it is a, a level that I have never mm -hmm. seen before mm -hmm. and this is my 13th year in special ed administration so I think um it speaks to like it's not just the pandemic like we can't just continue to say it's the pandemic there are other factors involved um and the numbers are growing yeah oh and I had one more question you've talked about a little bit about um that you see down the road um possibly a need for not for more positions is like things hold more or less um but but in terms of pd um did you have specific ideas about or you're just suggest like you're just thinking that that's that will what be what the services need is just a bolstering of of professional development i think that we can um enhance our programs with greater expertise um enhance the teacher's repertoire of skills knowledge um the the research is changing daily or you know the best practices so keeping um abreast of that for the language based learning for social emotional for autism um things things are coming out daily so i think it is incumbent upon us um to keep pace with that information and utilize that information to enhance our programs so i think that's done through professional development research training um, and it's ongoing and as teachers well we have a fabulous staff not everybody stays forever so it, it, it there has to be some revolving training that occurs to bring people up to speed there's one more question for me um, are the teachers receiving any training around like the science of reading um in carlisle we had you know we had a few meetings about the soldier story podcast and um all of the conversations around that um are teachers being trained around the science of reading and how to support students through that type of thing? All of, yes, all of the special education teachers um, are trained in, they're all aware of the science of reading. Many, many, many are trained in the Wilson Reading Program, which is a research-based, Orton-Gillingham-based program. Um, we have some teachers who are Orton-Gillingham-based, uh, trained as well. So they um, they do, many of our students need that type of approach and that explicit and direct multi-sensory instruction. Where are we seeing the need? Is it spelling? Is it um, sounding out the words? Is it writing? Where are we seeing the need with students around that? So most of the students have that we identify who require that multi-sensory sequential explicit instruction um are considered dyslexic um or specifically re uh, reading disabled and they um if if a child is not able to decode they're not able to encode which is spelling and that comes later so they need to master um the the language code first in terms of reading and then that will expand to the writing in terms of spelling and then larger um writing uh you know paragraph sentences paragraphs essays i don't know if anybody wants to yeah i mean we're not seeing that so much at the high school but the, by the time they get to us at ninth grade are that pretty much has been taught for many years um hopefully they're not you know coming to us at ninth grade um right. having those intense needs um so yeah i think the the more training at the elementary level is where they're doing the, the interventions and the things of that nature usually by the time they get to ninth grade at most a lot of that is remediated um if not all and I yeah, think that you'll in the, where where we do see it. Um, I think in answer to your question and to dovetail with what Grant said, uh, we have screeners. Um, we use the Star 360, but in kindergarten all the way up now to 10th grade, we just added 10th grade, and there's five areas of reading. And if students are showing a vulnerability, like below grade level, in any one of those five, then we do a deeper dive. We call it using a the dibbles, which is like the data, the art tool that is used to diagnose dyslexia. So that's how we 
pick it up and then there's ways to Mike, and I think that you're going to see a shift. I th think you're going to see a shift over time with the dyslexia screener at kindergarten, first grade, um, the interventions, multi-tiered system of support for, with a very structured intervention model um, to remediate and address issues earlier on and rewire the brain, quite honestly. So children are, are readers and don't struggle the way um, that they once did. And again, that goes back to the comprehensive evaluations that we're now doing as well if it comes to a, the level of uh, special ed referral. Um, and we know so much more. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. It's exciting. Thank you. It's great. Thank you. Anyone else? My questions have already been addressed. I want to thank all of you for coming today. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's a big ask, and uh, you're very gracious with your time and all your information. Thank you. And especially Debbie. I know. Extra thanks to Debbie because this is your last school committee meeting with us. So thank you for all of your time you spent with us. I know. I know. And it's, you know, it's really great to just see all of that high school programming come alive through your presentation because, you know, I think that you can read about it, but I feel like we could definitely hear about what's really happening there and adjustments that have been made over the past few years and even like study skills in ninth grade versus like when you have an eighth grade parent saying, I don't know, is it leap? Is it rap? I don't know which one it is, but to have that year in ninth grade to really figure out which path those kids are going to go in has been great. And then the new merging of the programs, it's really, really exciting to see what's happening at the high school. So thank you all for coming. Thank Appreciate you. it. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Have a great night. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Hard work. <laughs> Yeah, you can feel free to stay, of course, but you know, we're, we're going to send you in your merry way because your school tomorrow morning. <laughs> and, oh, the Celtics are on too. Okay. <laughs> we'll expect some updates, maybe. <laughs> I know, I know. Well, we'll be quick. <laughs> um, so next up, we have CPAC will be joining us. And I think we have Casey Atkins and Chris, Chris Streeter. Yeah. Yeah. All right, well. Tarlow, sorry. Streeter Tarlow. Streeter Tarlow, sorry. And and I'll ask you to please speak into the mic because we'll be reminded that we're not speaking to the mic. Thank you. Thank you. No, just share. Yeah, share it. All right. Um, you've had some very nice uh, looking presentations this evening. Very informative. Very um pleasing to the eye as well. We're more minimalist in our PowerPoint <laughs> approach this evening, very sort of very circa 1996. Um, we are the Concord Public and Concord Carlisle Regional uh, Special Education Parent Advisory Council. So what is that? Well, we're the parents behind the students, many of whom you just heard about through the programs at the high school. Um, I'm not entirely sure. Do I? Uh, Aaron's not in the Same room. You have a new next. next uh, still just, right. I'm just, this is new for me. Um, so just a quick overview of what we're going to discuss this evening. We do an annual report to you all each year, this time of year, talking about what we've done, reiterating our purpose, our mission, our membership, what our priorities were for the year and our accomplishments and what we have looking ahead. Next. Thank you, Aaron. I'm going to see if my eyes can reach the screen here. It's always important for us to reiterate our purpose. There's so much of it that can sound like legalese and sort of, you know, fancy mission statements that have been crafted together. But our purpose and our charge are codified in Mass General Law. We're here to advise the school committee on matters that pertain to the education and safety of students with disabilities and to meet regularly with school officials to participate in the planning, development, and evaluation of the school committee's special education programs. Our mission statement is to ensure an appropriate education for children with disabilities and to foster and support a collaborative and inclusive culture in our schools and community that values diversity and recognizes the contributions and uniqueness of each learner. We work in partnership with the school administration and the school committee to support students and further their goals of diversity, equity, and inclusion. We provide outreach, support, and education to inform and empower families and members of the community through events, 
workshops, and communication via newsletters, social media, and our website. We welcome and encourage all members of the community to engage and take part in these efforts. Next. Our membership is comprised of parents, guardians, and caregivers of students on individual individualized education plans and 504 plans and other interested parties. The CPAC strives to cultivate a membership that reflects the linguistic, religious, racial, cultural, ge uh, geographic, and socioeconomic diversity of the districts and intends to include members from the preschool, each elementary school, the middle school, high school, inclusive of alternative tr and transition programs, which have been renamed as you just saw, uh, 18 through 22 program and out of district placements, inclusive of uh, case collaborative. And our membership includes parents, guardians, and caregivers from Boston, Carlisle, and Concord. Next. Okay, a little less of me reading off the slides and a little more, um, a little more, I guess, off the cuff. Um, my name is Casey Atkins, and I am currently the president of our volunteer board at CPAC. I'm joined this evening by Chris Tarlow. Yeah, hi, I'm, I uh, work on the events and some of the publicity. Chris very kindly stepped in to help us with publicity uh, this year. As uh, any volunteer board, sometimes we have folks who can devote a lot of time and attention to the work and other times life uh, gives us different options. Um, our board is, uh, we also include on here Kelly O'Donnell, who's our vice president, Sarah Betancourt, who's membership chair, Ashley Healy, who's our secretary, Megan Carroll, publicity chair, Chris, uh, Ishu Kumar, member at large, and Eva Mostafi, uh, member at large and former school committee member. Next. This um, really just visually impressive slide. Uh, is there to show sort of our liaison, some of the openings that we have, but ideally what we try to do is have folks in each of the schools and programs so that we can start to build a pipeline of community and a future board to carry on these efforts. So um, there are openings in several of the new programs, are relabeled programs at the high school and some of our other programs as well. It also is a great sort of map to look at to see all of the programs that are in the districts and start to put some names to the faces. Next. Our priorities and accomplishments for the 2022-2023 year uh, included some carryover from last year. We partnered with the interim director of student services, Debbie Dixon, as you all heard of him, on a wide range of programming uh, and events for caregivers. Um, Chris will get into it a little bit further, but we switched up our model this year and every other month, instead of doing business meetings every month, we did a topic area of interest. Uh, Chris will get into some of the ones that were really popular this year, but a way to bring out more education to parents, bring them into the fold a little bit more, give them something a little bit more interesting rather than just the regular daily grind of, of our business meetings. We continue to work to raise the visibility and profile of the CPAC. We participated in a lot of hiring committees, search committees this year. It was a busy year for you all. And we deeply, deeply appreciate being included in those search committees. Um, we also participated in the district strategic planning committee, as well as the district's DEIB strategic steering committee. Next. Debbie received a gift from us last week. It's a mug that says, I came, I saw, I conquered. <laughs> Just kind of perfect for her. Um, Debbie helped uh, facilitate monthly communication with Dr. Hunter, with Debbie, and she has always been and really sets a high standard for engagement and involvement, which we're very confident will be carried over with our new um, uh, sorry, new student services director, Angel Charles. Um, we'd also like to note that uh, both Alexa, Chair Anderson, and Sarah Wilson were uh, frequent 
participants in our business meetings and our events, along with other members who joined along as well. Court, you would show up too. We'd see lots of folks there. So we really appreciate that engagement. Um, it's important for the um, school committee and the public at large to be aware of what we do um, and to have knowledge of this base of students. Events. Um, Chris will speak more when your when her slide comes up, unless you want to pop in now. But the events were focused around parents as partners, extended school year, and summer camp um, options, as well as uh, a delightful overview of DCAP and 504 and what does it mean? Because most of us, in fact, did not know what it meant. <laughs> Next. Um, our appreciation awards are one of our favorite things to do as a board. Um, we celebrated last week our sixth annual CPAC appreciation awards. Back in, I believe it was 2017, we had our first and there were about 24 nominations of um, teachers, administrators, staff who get nominated by families who say, you know, this is somebody who's gone above and beyond for my child. They've been wonderful in these many ways. We'd like them to be to be recognized. Um, this year, we had another record-breaking year. Last year, we broke our, our previous record. Now, we, we broke it again. We've received 150 submissions. Um, out of curiosity, uh, Dr. Hunter, how many how many educators are there in, or how many staff are in the district? Total? Total. 750. Including tutors and all the amazing people who support our kids. So this this was a pretty big percentage, and it speaks to the build out of the continuum of services that was just spoken about. Because that build out isn't just FTEs; it is culture, it is inclusion, it is recognition of our students within the entire buildings. There were teachers, administrators. Uh, custodians, other staff, librarians who were um, included in those nominations. So it really was building wide. Um, over 70 families uh, participated and nominated usually multiple people. And there were um, of the 150 submissions, sorry, that was 114 specific recipients. So several people received more than one. Um, and Willard was kind enough to host us last week. Next, please. One of the wonderful parts about the Appreciation Awards is we invite students uh, from the high school to do their presentations for, for the folks that they've nominated. And every year, they never disappoint. The students are thoughtful. They are so um, eloquent and so moving in their remarks. And it is a really sort of tangible way to see the difference that educators and staff make in our students' lives. Um, I think there was there were not there, there wasn't a dry eye in the auditorium after um, these two presented their uh, awards to their honorees, Pam Gore and Clark Whitney. Uh, we also recognized Chris Chamberlain of Thoreau, a reading specialist, who received the largest number of submissions. Um, it's kind of a big deal. Um, and Donna Balmuth, who has been an occupational therapist at the Concord Integrated Preschool for, I believe, 19 Long time. years. It might be longer than that. Is it 29? That's 29. 29. I know. I, I'm going to need some practice. <laughs> it was bigger on my screen. Um, 29 years of service. Um, and her, the comments from her families were, were really beautiful. Um, also, our new state representative reached out to the CPAC and said, I would really like to recognize the folks who go above and beyond on this and whoever receives these awards, we have to, we had to inform him that that might require a lot of toner from the printer because it's over a hundred people. And then we narrowed it down to, to sort of our top two there. Um, but it was great to see his involvement as well. 
We honored Angel Charles, who's the outgoing principal of Thoreau, who's really responsible for so many of the programs that started at the elementary level. The bridge program at Thoreau, which focuses on autism spectrum, as well as other students in, needing, uh, in need of similar types of services. All right, Erin, my slideshow is gone and I might be flying blind here. <laughs> Hold on. Yeah, she's texting me. I'll panic. Probably. No problem. I can go off of. Yep, she just got kicked out. <laughs> I can get it, Casey. I'll just. Okay, no problem. Um, so Angel we, Charles, who's host? How did she get? Angel is uh, due to be in on, I believe, July 1st, the new student services director. Um, for those of you who don't know, as I mentioned, Angel really is responsible for some of the robust programming yeah. that started at the elementary level and throw and has continued through the high school and beyond. Um, what that meant for many families uh, is that through Angel's effort with the support of Lori, many young families were able to actually see a path and a journey for their children within the district. Is that you? That's me. I got it. Go back. Appreciate you. I always appreciate Debbie's support. She's always there for it. <laughs> oh, now you're on the PDF version. I am. You know, it wouldn't be as it wouldn't be a Casey Atkins CPAC party without a little technology glitch. So <laughs> You hear. Um, we also honored Dr. Hunter uh, right then. again this year. Um, as this is that sort of rounding out of the continuum of services in terms of staffing within the district, this is your sixth year here. Yeah. <laughs> and so much has happened in six years. Transforming special education within a district is like trying to parallel park a cruise ship. And <laughs> there's a lot that goes into it, not just budgetarily, culturally, within the schools, and across the entire system, building to building, the families, the staff, everyone. That takes a lot of concerted effort, and we appreciate it, and it doesn't go unnoticed. It hasn't always been perfect. Nothing is within, in this world, um, but it really has been remarkable what's been done in six years. Next, or scroll down, please. Okay, thank you. Um, so yeah, we had um, this year, we did I think four parent coffees or meetups, and we have some more planned. Um, the first one was very well attended. I don't think we had like 30 people come, which was nice to have new newcomers to special ed. And there was a lot of out of towners, like you said, a lot of new, totally new people. Um, so it was nice to see them come. And then um, we've done, let's see, we had Dr. Ross Green do a presentation on collaborative and proactive solutions. And we had it was in person, so it was our first like in-person event that we've done <laughs> since pre-COVID. And um, I think we had like 40 or 50 people at CCHS. And then there was 500 people registered. I think not everybody could log on and hear it very well. <laughs> um, but since then we posted online and we've had, I think 350 people view it. So it's been right. pretty well, well viewed. Um, uh, we did the basic rights presentation this year. We tried to use someone outside the Federation. We used Danielle Green and um, just to get a different perspective, I guess. And that was good. Um, the summer camp presentation, I think, was awesome. You know, everyone sort of came together and brainstormed ideas for summer camps. And um, Debbie did a great presentation about what Concord offers for summer school and BSY. And then we had Concord Rec come talk about their inclusion program. Um, and let's see, is extra, it's, it's extra steps Timberlake? Timberlake or is no, it it's different? different? It's, oh. like, it's different, yeah. Because we also had Timber, Timber Nook. It's the same person. She's a oh, OT. Okay, okay. Um, and that was nice to hear about just other things in the community that people can access. The Peter Pan Center, she gave a good talk about what she offers there as well. Um, 
And then we did have Debbie again did the um, the DCAP 504 IEP. What's the difference? Talk, which was really interesting because I mean, even people in special ed just kind of don't really know what what are all the differences. And um, Allison Novak talked that. I think Francis Francis Wolf also spoke. Um, and Laura Brandt. Um, so I think that was really helpful to do just like these these talks with the district that, you know, the specialists and all the different people that have so much knowledge coming together and um, working with us to inform parents. Um, and then we had the parents um, as partners with Dr. Hunter and Debbie, and that was sort of how to work together and to support students within the school. Um, and this was in the summer we had, um, the CPAC had a design forum about the middle school and um, the design, you know, what was it? Um, who was that that came in? The chair of the building, the CMS building committee. Yeah, and they had um, another woman there. I'm blanking on the name of it. One of the, one one of the architects. architects. Yeah. One and architects. sort of like inclusion, like things that were going to help people with disabilities within the building and people could ask questions. And that was, I think, very in informative too. So that was basically it. <laughs> Chris is being modest. She works very hard on these events and coordinating them. And it was really, uh, the Ross Green event was really something to be able to get Ross Green to come to the district. So you, it, Chris deserves a huge amount of credit for that. And there were hundreds and hundreds of people who are online. Um, again, we want to reiterate just, this was a, a wonderful result of partnering uh, with the district, these programs, the um, DCAP 504 and IEP, what does it mean? What does it mean for my child? Most people don't understand or have the opportunity to sort of demystify what a multi-tiered system of support is, what a DCAP is, what are these layers of intervention when something is coming up that doesn't seem right or out of the ordinary, what are the steps and processes in place? And in my experience in the district, we had not had that before. So a lot of this was going towards demystifying the process and gaining more sort of interest and engagement in how to be involved, but also how to advocate for your child. This is sort of a bit of a stock slide. We are on social media. We hope that you follow us. Uh, we're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, um, and you'll see us post updates and interesting articles there. Um, further profile raising, um, our board got quite, uh, adept at logging into finance committee meetings, um, throughout the, the year school committee meetings, uh, PTG meetings. And, um, it was very, uh, illuminating and educational for us to see the process with the finance committee uh, that took place this year and how the CMS budget uh, came to pass at town meeting. Um, I will get to that in another slide. Uh, go ahead and move forward, please. The search committee participation. Um, so much appreciation for Kristen Anderson for how she runs a search committee. I got to experience it with the Thoreau principal search and it was, it was something I need, I need Kristen to organize my life actually, I think. Um, but we were invited and included in uh, the search committees for the deputy director of student services, which also that role includes the out of district uh, coordinator. Chris served as our representative on that. The director of student services hiring, we were, we had two seats, two representatives on that. And for Thoreau, Principal Thoreau has, I think it's, is it roughly 20% of the student population is on an IEP or a 504. Um, and we were included in that. And it was a really thoughtful, uh, inclusive um outreach to us from both the PTA president and from Kristen. Um, that really means a lot to us. Having representation on these boards means a lot. And we really felt our voice was heard and our perspectives were taken. Uh, that goes a lot to forming that relationship and to making sure that the administrators and staff that are hired, are um, we feel part of that process and some ownership. So thank you. Next slide. 
The District Strategic Planning Committee, uh, again, hats off to Kristen for organizing. How many people are in that strategic plan? Is it 50? Yeah. yeah. Not a small group. Um, and again, we had two representatives, uh, myself and Evan Mustafi. Um, the I was on the well-being and mental health subgroup, um, which is certainly very pertinent to our student population. I was on the mission, uh, vision, core values, and theory of action group. Um, our placement on the groups was very thoughtful and well done. And the strategic objectives really wove in so many uh, important factors of our student population, multiple paths to success, well-being and mental health, inclusive culture, and innovative environment. I'll note that well-being back in 2018, that um, objective did not include mental health on it. And it does this time around. Um, I think that's something that certainly is a national trend. It is a trend here. It is something to be eyes open towards in terms of the student population and what is an emerging uh, theme. We know that from our student population that many of our students may be the first to sort of um, present on some of those um, in the mental health realm and appreciate the uh, that it's raised in its importance and that it is part of the objectives of the district. Next slide, please. The DEIB Strategic Steering Committee, we were involved uh, the year prior uh, as well and our CPAC representative was Sarah Betancourt, our membership chair. Um, we were, have been, part of it from the beginning, as I, as I mentioned, and um, a lot of this was sort of staying up to speed on the professional development, student achievement, the bias incident reporting, METCO hiring equity audits um, and inclusion. And um, I will note here that actually we, this is a good example of, of where some collaboration came in nicely, where uh, April is traditionally known as autism, Awareness Month, um, and their, uh, the DEIB director, Andrew, and the district sent out some information on it, and um, there's been a, a lot that's shifted in the autism community around the organizations that are um, that are appropriately highlighting the resources and elevating the voices of self-advocates. Andrew was very responsive. Um, he issued very quickly a um, another email citing more resources, and we appreciate being able to work like that. Um, that's important um, for parents and caregivers. It's a shifting landscape, and and we're learning as we go too. I certainly, I know I used to be more into autism awareness. I'm very aware of it now, and now it's more acceptance. Um, and you know we're. We're running with those themes and shifting, and we appreciate that flexibility and working with us on that as well and being adaptable as this is a moving environment. Next slide, please. Looking ahead, um, we are always interested in increasing family engagement because it all sort of leads into the build out of the continuum of education. Now, Debbie mentioned that the FTE process is complete for now on that, but the um, building into the fabric of our school community and our greater community is work that continues every day, whether it's through PD, whether it's through the consultation contracts with Landmark or other organizations, whether it's through just having a better understanding between community students, typical peers, and students who are neurodiverse or have other disabilities. Um, that is something that is dynamic. It is work that's very intentional every day and every year. So it will be part of our long-term planning every day and every year. It's making the greater community aware that our student population looks very different today than it did five years ago. 10 years ago, 20 years ago. And that as a district, the entire process of planning 
whether it's budgetarily, policy-wise, staffing, has an eye towards these students who are protected by law for a free and appropriate education that either happens in their community district or out of district. And it is a dollars and cents equation as well as a feel good opportunity when these students are in our district. So that is something that we will always have an eye towards, whether it is through budget advocacy, whether it is through our continued collaboration and partnership with the school committee and with the administration um, and all types of other outreach and being thoughtful of our own needs to be better at including Carlisle better at our outreach with our Boston families. Um, that is something that we look both internally and externally for. Next slide, please. I think we've had it, that's it. So any questions that we can answer for you? This was excellent. I really enjoyed CPAC appreciation though. I mean, like that was visually, uh, just such a great event to see all of those educators being honored for their work that they do every day. And it wasn't just the special educators. It was coaches. It was custodians, bus driver, like you name it. Everyone was there. So I really appreciate there's a ton of work that goes into that. There's a ton of work that goes into the events, but they're so important to the community to keep having those events. So thank you. Thank you. I also want to point out with those appreciation awards, one of the things that you see is a lot of general educators that are that are in there. Mm -hmm. And that is really important. And it also speaks to the PD that is given to our general educators, because to be very clear, I'm fairly certain that they didn't receive their licensure or get their postgraduate degrees with this with a specific set of skills around students with disability or neurodiversity that comes through professional development it comes through exposure it comes through how the administrators both in the district and in the buildings set the culture and tone Anyone else? Made it very difficult to pose questions because it's very thorough. It's a very comprehensive. Yeah, there's yeah. You could thank Court. Both very much. <laughs> just just follow up my question. Where can Carla find out about your meetings? How can we get that information so we can? You bring up a really good point. So our previous president couple of years ago was a Carlisle, a Carlisle um, member. And I think one of the things as we sort of hammer out our specific priorities for the year to come, because we've got our board elections that are coming up next month, is more intentional outreach and partnership with Carlisle. Um, and I know Eva mentioned, she's like, we need to do, Carlisle needs to do these appreciation awards. It's a great way to really bring people in and just how much growth we've had in six years with doing those awards really, it, it just sort of cranks out the, um, it's more and more teachers understand it, more families get it because it's really up to the families to know that they're going to nominate people and it brings people into the fold. So I think that should be a, you know, a a bigger priority in credit to Chris. Chris reaches out to them quite a bit to partner on events. Yeah, actually. Yeah. So they're, they are invited to all our event, events that we have and um, meetings that we have. I do send to their newsletter. So whoever manages the Carlo newsletter, I'm not even sure. I just send it to the email, but um, yeah, we post all that to the newsletters for each school. Um, so if they, if they search it out, they can find it too. <laughs> I think also with a lot of the information that is now coming up on the on the district website in terms of what the programs are. So as you saw with with the CCHS overview of programs, part of what will be helpful for us to coordinate with, and I would believe it happens in Carlisle at the public's at the uh, pre K through eight level. Um, that mapping of what the programs are and what the supports are is important for families in Concord and Carlisle and Boston to see, to be able to visualize their child's journey through the district. And um, that I think will help maybe bring some of that Carlisle transition piece and from the parent perspective. I think it's really robustly done on the school, on the school side of things, but building some of those partnerships 
within the two communities as they see their path going forward. So we welcome any introductions to folks in Carlisle if you'd like. Thank you. All right, well, thank you so much for joining us. This was excellent. We look forward to it every year. And tonight's meeting, it was just, I mean, it was great that you, you know, you just followed Debbie's presentation. I just want to thank them because you see how engaged CPAC is. Yes, we made the invitations and they have to engage and participate. And um, that really mattered a lot. Your, your presence keeps that lens on at all times. So thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, does anyone need a break? No, we're good. Keep going. Okay. All right. So next up, I'm going <laughs> to, like, moving on. Next up, we are going on to our quarterly updates. And so you have the thousand level. And I'm just going to ask Bob, um, we, we had a meeting this week, and I'm going to have you do the overview of kind of what we're looking at. So going forward, we will be voting our our quarterly transfers, but we want to get it right. So I've asked Bob to kind of help me with this. Okay. So we've actually gone through, um, um, hang on one sec. So we've actually gone through the 1000 level and the 100 level um, previously, and we've presented it, what we're uh, moving forward with is um, voting uh, on a quarterly basis. Um, these are the same reports that were presented uh, previously. Um, tonight is just uh, a new step, but we're going to be voting on these. What we're voting on is year-to-date adjustments, the second column. Um, right now, um, we're in the CCS, CCRSD meeting, so... Um, what we'll be doing um, during the action item section is voting on the adjustments that we've um, made this year at, at the 1000 level. Um, and this is kind of consistent with the guidance that Tracy Novick um, mm -hmm. uh, provided to us. Um, and again, this is kind of after the fact as we uh, move through the year. Right now we're catching up at Q3. Um, and just for clarity, we did talk about this in our budget workshop. You know, as things occurred during the year, we are making adjustments, but we're pausing at the end of each quarter um, and requesting uh, approval um, from the school committee as kind of a best practice. Ultimately, what's required is at the end of the year, we have a final vote by the school committee on the transfers for the year at the thousand level, which is the level that we um, present and approve our budget at. Um, so this information tonight is the same information you've seen on April 3rd and um, somewhere uh, thereafter. Um, but I just wanted to clarify that we are voting and we'll present year-to-date information as we go um, each quarter going forward. Okay, any discussion or questions on that? Okay. All right, so we will vote that um, in our action items at the end of the meeting. Now on to the cell phone tower, and we have um, David Tivnin with us, and he's joining us on Zoom. But just to give it just a general background and overview of kind of how we looked at this process. So as you all know, there is very limited um, cell phone information, data, like you can't make a phone call on the campus, you coverage. can't text on the campus, it's coverage. And so, and it really is safety. This is not so parents can text their kids to say, hey, I'll meet you at the flagpole. It's not that this is safety of children in the building. It is safety of athletes on the field, visitors to the campus. I think we have a very vibrant campus during the week and on weekends. So it's probably one of the most densely populated areas in the town during the week and actually on weekends with 1300 students, probably 200 teachers. I don't know, it, about 1500 people are on that campus every single day. Um, and with basically no coverage at all. So we started to explore the options of um, a possible cell phone tower. That is one option. And then this week, just to give you a background as to what we've done this week, Alexa, Lori, and I met with um, Jason Bulger and Chris Carmody, and we talked about what is kind of happening with the town in terms of cell phone um, maybe additions. And so, you know, there are some things happening in the town, but nothing is a done deal right now. And we all know that downtown Concord is also a problem. So 
we started with that this week and then we also i think is peter kelly going to be on too You're at some point tonight that. okay we also met with it um, Peter Kelly's director of IT at Concord and Concord Carlisle, and we ex we met with him about other options too. There are three other options that we're looking at. So it's cell phone tower is one. Another option is Wi-Fi calling enabled inside the building. Another option is Wi-Fi calling outside of the building. And then the fourth option is you might see it on a college campus. They are the blue lights, which are like, it's like a whole system or ecosystem as i think peter called it mm -hmm. of connected if there's an emergency you at least know where to go so if you're down at memorial stadium and there's an injury down there you know where the blue light is you can hit the button and you're going to get assistance right away so mm -hmm. we're in the exploring all options mode right now so i just wanted to line that up before we mm -hmm. started talking about the cell phone tower so you can i think just one note to make to some degree, that's because certain things are timelier than others. Um, some of the things internally we could do might be more effective quickly, um, quicker uh, than the tower. And I think, you know, Dave's here to talk a little more on the on options the for the tower. Uh, Derek from our IT is here to, we're at a very high level on those options. You yeah. just, like, we don't know how much they cost if they're viable. <laughs> so there's there's pretty, no information. Significant okay. very, uh, piece of information we don't have. But we're just really exploring everything because the need is acute and mm -hmm. urgent, I think, from our perspective. And just to be, you know, transparent with anyone that is on the call, like we are exploring all options that we have to improve what's happening on our campus and to improve safety for everyone on our campus. So I just had to just say that is to kind of set the stage for our discussion on the cell phone tower. Mm -hmm. So I would welcome David if you want to um, unmute. And I don't know, can you show video or do you want to? I don't think. No, maybe not. Okay. So um, maybe Bob, you and I can talk about what we did with David. Sure. I don't I don't hear him. David, are you with us? Yes, yes I'm, I'm here. Hello. Okay. Great. Do you want to start first and just kind of give an overview of kind of where we're at in our process? Well, I... I, I just heard you say that you, you folks are actually still in the process of making a decision as to what you actually want to do. So one of the options is, of course, a cell tower. So I'm here. To, I'm prepared to answer questions, if I may, um, if you have questions about the tower versus the other options that you're looking at. Okay. That makes sense. I mean, if 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 the um, if the regional school uh, committee decides to you know to to pursue the cell the cell uh, to, uh, the cell tower option the school committee would have to release an rfp request for proposals and um, it would be open to you know verizon at&t whoever else would be interested in responding to it and we i'm told by verizon management that we intend to respond to it with the intent of winning it and um and we did provide you know, uh, three options, some lease exhibits that they could be used as, you know, for the exercise for you folks doing your your due diligence and figuring out which option you want to pursue um, with not only technology, but if it was a cell tower where on the property it could go um, and, and, make, and make sense. So. David, can I ask of the three, I'm looking at the site plan that's attached to our agenda. Does, yeah. from your perspective, from a, usage standpoint um do you guys have a preferred site meaning is there a location that is of, of the three places you identified that the tower could go is one um optimal or preferred in terms of which would solve um the greatest problems at our on our campus Sure. So, you know, I'm a real estate consultant for Verizon Wireless. So my job is basically to keep as many people as happy as I possibly can. You know, we're obviously trying to provide a service to the community, uh, the campus specifically. Um, option two, in my mind, would perhaps keep the most amount of people happy. Um, I think it's the least intrusive. It's most disguised. It's tucked into the woods. So there's, you know, there's several 
uh, I'm going to call it 50 feet of trees, of existing woods, like existing trees that would be, you know, blocking the view shed of the compound below. Um, it would still provide excellent, excellent uh, coverage to the school campus as well as the surrounding area. So I think option two is probably most hidden. I mean, they'll all do the same thing, you know, in layman's terms from a RF perspective, but option two is probably most disguised. And yeah, just for anyone that might be watching, I'll just try and do my best to describe option two. So if you are at the high school campus and you are driving up the hill, the main office on your right, and you look at kind of that lacrosse practice field with the wall ball there, um, it be, it's behind that large concrete structure. Is that a fair description, Bob? Yes, and then the, the, the second option is halfway up the field, uh, just extending further up. Um, well, I, I don't know what number options we're calling them. There's two options on the side of the field, one behind the container, and the other one's about halfway up the, the field, the grass field there. Um, and I think, are we only- we, we talked about option three, which is closer to where like the throwing circle is, about that really needing a lot of excavation. Didn't we talk about that not really being an option? And also- yeah. um, yeah, it's closer to the school. That the the distance to the school was was more significant too in the in the two locations we're mm -hmm. looking at. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know what the exact number was. Was it six to seven hundred feet, David? I don't remember either. But this one, uh, you know, again, in in trying to keep as many people ha as happy as we can, I think this one's the uh, it's most you know it's hidden best, yet yet still providing excellent service because it is a high area um, topographically speaking. So it, it would work well for Verizon and the other carriers. And um, again, I think it's tucked away. So it's behind the school, of course, too. So I, I think this is the best location. And can you remind me how many feet would it be up? Is it 125? Probably, yes. David, do you mind just re reminding uh, us and walking us through the timeline of, of what happens first and when? Sure, that would be up to you folks. Really, you, you're driving the bus, so you folks would have to make the decision to choose this option for technology providing service for the campus. And if an RFP is to be released, again, you folks really control that time frame. If once the RFP is released, there's a time frame as to when it's due. You know, would we we would respond to that with the intent of winning. Uh, then we go into the lease negotiations, and once that is finalized, we would um, apply for our zoning permits with uh, with the town of Concord. Um, all that said, you know these things do take time, unfortunately, um, even when I'm dealing with a private entity. But you know, from if it, it, it takes between a year and eighteen months if things move relatively quickly um, for the site to be activated, and again, that would be for Verizon Wireless only. The other carriers would, um, that, that's if Verizon Wireless wins it, the other carriers would have to follow suit. Yeah, and I think that that's why, you know, we have, we're starting to have other conversations about how can we help the safety of our campus right now as quickly as possible, which is, you know, why we're talking about other options either in addition to a cell phone tower, because we really, we're at a critical point right now that um, we really need communication up there. Understood. Yeah. Well, Carrie, yep. What's the, um, David, thanks for joining us. Um, the, I'm Carrie, I don't know if you can <laughs> see us speaking. Um, I'm just wondering what the coverage area of a tower is. Like, is there a radio, like a yeah. radio yeah. around it, or how does that how does that work? Um, let me think how I can explain to you. Um, I, 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 you know, the short answer is probably about a mile. Um, so here are the sites that we have currently on the air in Concord. Uh, we're on the Emerson Hospital on Route Two. Um, I developed a tower on Nursnack Hill. I also developed one of the towers over at the wastewater treatment plant, and I was involved heavily with the, the tower at the Middlesex School. Um, if this tower goes up, we will still need a tower 
site, well, I should say a cell site downtown. And we're looking at one of the church steeples as well as the, the umbrella building. So, the, in, so both the high school is, re, is needed and so was in the site downtown, either the umbrella building or one of the churches. So, you know, they're pretty, they're pretty tight. Um, I, I hope that gives you an idea of where we need to be. We're also, we also have an open search ring over in uh, West Concord, which is not currently active. It's not funded right now. So, and I guess this is more of a question for you all, but um, I'm like, I, I heard you say, Tracy, that you all yeah. met with the town earlier this week, but mm -hmm. it just seems to me, I just want to make sure that we're not doing anything in isolation, if that makes sense. Cause no. no, not at all. No. Um, because it does seem like it's a town-wide problem. This is yeah. not just a high school problem. Yes, correct. Um, correct. So anything that we do at the high school, I would want to make sure is yep. to solve the town-wide problem or to help solve the town-wide right. problem. Okay. Right. It, are there any other sites, David, in Concord that you've looked at or are possibilities? Other than church? Other than uh, school um, campus? Other than the, the, the high school campus and the church. Are there any other active places that you're looking at? Not really. I mean, the um, the downtown was the priority site. Um, I've been working on that. I'm ashamed to say, close to seven years now. For various reasons. Um, yeah, so, yeah. and and again, I you know these these can be controversial, but people have phones and. You know, we were trying to figure out the best path of uh, breaking the ice and getting one site up and then let the other one follow suit. So that's when, you know, when I had met uh, you, you know, years back with uh, Dr. Hunter, we had discussed that and we thought it was best to go forward with the, um, the town first and the, and the school second. And I've been, you know, I've been having a difficult time with the various administrations in town and, and figuring out a, a place to go. So that's happening, it's still happening. But we still need a site here as well. So we're kind of taking a double barrel shotgun approach to it now. We're working on both aggressively. I have one other. Yep, go ahead. This is more for you yeah. too. Um, the when you talk about Wi-Fi calling, is it currently disabled? Like are you not currently allowed to do that? Is Kids are not allowed to put their phones good. on the Wi-Fi right now. Oh, okay. So it would mean which would drastically change. Yeah, I think and Derek's on, he'll interrupt me if I'm wrong. Um, what they're studying is if we could allow just texting uh allowing the kids to get wi-fi so they can text for parent we get a lot of parent requests to be able to reach their children at school yeah. these days um it makes sense we can all reach everyone everywhere yeah. these days and um so trying for a minimal approach we feel a little more but I, th I feel better about that now that the phones have a structured house during class so that we're not texting all through class, but we do need to do something. I think we're getting a lot of parent requests. I mean, I literally stood at the high school. The parent came to pick their child up. It was after school. We're downstairs. All she wants to do is find him. Yeah. She can't get a cell signal to go through to find him. And it, uh, I mean, it's not funny, right? We, no, the office was closed. Yeah. Like it really was paralyzing. So, and it's a big building. You can't just go walk around. So there's just a practicality piece to it. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I, I will say I had another issue the other day, unified track, there was a torrential downpour and they were at Emerson oh. park and there was actually like a, they actually ended up getting a bus. There were all sorts of wonderful things that happened. I didn't realize that that's what happens. You know, if like in the middle of a track meet, there's just a torrential downpour. So the kids were brought inside of the hunt gym and I'm getting like a phone call. It's like, bleh, bleh, bleh. Nothing. And so I'm at the high school just looking around. There's nothing happening. I'm like, I don't know where any of these kids are. And there are like 40 kids somewhere. They're not at the high school. I'm driving around the whole campus. I finally see Aaron. I like flag him down. He's like, Hunt Jim, the bus is coming there at five. But you know, it's just, and then if you're by Emerson, there's no service at Emerson mm -hmm. either. Mm -hmm. So it was really just really super challenging to find a kid. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, does anyone have any other questions for David? Um, if I could just jump in, this is Derek. Um, David, uh, a quick question. If you said you had a site currently on Emerson Hospital right now, um, and as Tracy just mentioned, uh, you're not getting very good signal by that location either. 
why would our repeater system not be picking up that signal um, from where we are right now? Derek, why don't we call David tomorrow and we'll ask all those questions just because our agenda is full, if that's all right. Okay. Okay, super. Uh, and sorry, mine was Emerson Field, not Emerson Hospital, which is in the downtown area. Sorry, just for clarity. Okay. Um, Court, did you have a question? Yeah, there are three high school sites noted. Um, and I know we have a high school specific problem, but to Carrie's point, we have a town problem too. Um, were you instructed to uh, keep this on the high school property or only to solve the high school problem? That's my first question. Hmm. Who's, who's the question to? To David. Well, we we were in touch with David about specifically the high school campus. Okay. We were in touch with him. Yeah. The so, town was not. So, in fact, uh, we could conceivably address the high school problem without insisting that the tower be on the high school property. I think that's what we're trying that's to figure we're out. Trying to figure out now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then uh, next question, you, you gave us three sites at the high school what were your criteria? Was it cost? Was it uh, was it signal strength? Was it aesthetics? How did those balance out? You've got a number of criteria, but how do you weigh those criteria? Is that question directed to me? Yes, yes. please. Yes. Uh, well, I guess. Well, I think the the first location it came in is option three. Well, I think Dr. Hunter originally wanted us to be uh, down below where the softball fields are, but that's a hole. So, I mean, a tower down there would not propagate, you know, would not cover, provide sufficient coverage unless a tower was probably 300 feet high. I'm mean, I'm saying that, you know, uh, joke, you know, tongue in cheek here, because it, 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 it's it's, multi, it's very very low. The high area where we're proposing option one and two. First of all, it's high ground. It's it's tuck, you know, it, everything comes into play. It has to work from an engineering perspective, but it has to work aesthetically as well. And I, I just think it really hits it hits everything. It's it's well disguised. It's behind everything. It's in the woods. It's elevated, and the tower could be of a of a reasonable height to accommodate not only Verizon but the other carriers as well, as well without being overly obtrusive. So it's it's all of these things, as I mentioned earlier. I'm like a juggler trying to keep as many people as happy as possible, but it has to work from an RF perspective for Verizon management to move forward. And can you just talk about cost to the district, David? I think that was the other part of course. Well, I question. think the I mean, I don't think the cost would be diff any different, you know, the the access road is going to be a little longer for option two than option one. Other than that, you know, that's the only difference in that cost. Option three, we're coming from a different angle. Um, I think I think we all agreed that that's not a, a viable option because there would be some major surgery having to be done for a retaining wall and whatnot, and the access road would be crossing multiple paths that are, that are currently used by the athletes and parents watching games. So I think but the we cost all... of the district is zero, correct? That's correct. That, that's correct. So the RFP is basically you're going to you're going to propose how much you'd pay us in rental and the cost, regardless of where we put it, the cost will be borne by whichever carrier wins the RFP. Correct. We have a solar farm about a thousand feet away from the high school. Has Verizon ever looked at that? Has, have you yes. had conversations with the town about that property? Yes. Not available. AT&T put a temporary cell tower there probably 15 or 20 years ago, and they were made to, they were, the town made them remove it. Uh, this, I've, been, I've been with Verizon for 24 years now. It's my 24th year. And when I first came on board, they were trying, this whole area was a problem back then. And I remember one of, I've mentioned this, that one of the site walks that, I don't know if it was Glenn Fry from the Eagles actually wrote a letter opposing that no longer there. Because uh, because of the Walden Pond, so you know, I think the, the other side of Route Two was kind of just off off the off the uh, option list. All right, we always note here in Concord that the action of a school committee doesn't bind a future school committee necessarily. Same with our select board. Um, I do remember well that uh, that episode that you're referring to, but that was quite quite some time ago. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so at this point, I think you've given us a lot to think about. Um, does anyone have any further questions for David while he's here? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, no, not a, a, this gentleman, but I just want to know what our next steps would be. So our next steps, um, and so David, I think we don't have any more questions for you right now, and we're going to continue to talk with you, and we'll keep you posted as to kind of where we're at as a school committee. Okay, great. Thank you. I'm, I'm available anytime. Uh, yeah. Can I just ask you, Dave, to clarify one thing, too? Um, we talked about the location and potentially other locations. Can you just clarify the um, how well this works based on where it's located? You said a, a coverage area of a mile, but is it um, more functional if it's closer to um, the high school, for example? No, I think the locations, I think Octum 1 and Octum 2 uh, would work fantastic for the area. Um, and if you, if you think about it, you know, again, I'm, I'm a real estate guy. I'm not the RF engineer. The town does have an RF engineer that can talk to it more directly with propagation maps and such. But you, you think of it like the pieces of a puzzle. And these, these when, they, when the signals propagate, they have to work with topography, usage, all kinds of different dynamics that uh, make them work well together. So if we, we will be successful with a installation downtown and this will complement that, and it will also reach the crossroad too, and, and and into the Walden Pond area. So, this was a very good site, in in, in in my opinion. Okay. Does well, that answer your question? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Okay. All right, David. I appreciate you joining us tonight, and um, we will be in touch. Okay. Thank you all. Thank so, you. Good night. Um, and in terms of Cynthia's question, next step. So I think we're at the very um, beginning of kind of investigating what we can do now. Um, you know, if you remember, like probably about a month ago, we had received correspondence from a parent as what are we going to do right now? So I think we're just right at the beginning of that. So I think there's going to be more to come with that. Um, I think that Peter Kelly and his team, Peter and Derek, have been starting this investigation to kind of see what some of our other options are that we can really get put in place quickly. And I think um, I am curious to see this sort of, I call it like the three pronged plan, the Wi-Fi enabled calling inside, the Wi-Fi enabled call it out, calling outside combined with the blue lights, the ecosystem. Um, because in our conversations, even with Peter yesterday, um, I don't remember. Uh, we were talking about that even with a cell phone tower to really bring the level of safety on that campus to like where we might want it. I know we haven't discussed that explicitly. It You might need some of these components anyway, or they might be a good idea to have anyway. So, you know, you might, even if we have a cell phone tower, we should, in fact, I think, do the due diligence of determining what these component parts of this ecosystem on the campus might cost us so that we can analyze, um, you know, how we're going to best keep the campus safe and achieve what we want to. You know, I think to Carrie's point, our our scope, I think at this table is kind of narrow, right? Um, we want to make sure that the campus is safe. However, we can best achieve that, I think, is probably what we discuss next, if that makes sense. But again, I think we don't have the data to have that conversation without knowing the costs, yeah. right? That's, yeah. So, yeah. So do you expect it before we time out this year or not? Um, oh, like when we would get that information? I would... Outside of this... Yeah, like hopefully, hopefully in the next few weeks, do you think we'd get some say, information? Say hopefully. No, hopefully. But now the problem is that we did hear from Peter is if like depending on equipment, you know, first of all, we'd have to see what the prices are first. And then it's like, then see what the equipment is. And then everything, some things get delayed, you know, so it's, it's, it's kind of like, we're not really sure what the time. They still have is. some supply chain. Supply chain issues in certain areas. So yes. You know, so I, I think that that one thing, like the Wi-Fi calling, that's the easy first step. But again, well, but, is it, but there's still costs associated with everything. So we have to see everything. Allowing first. all the students on our wireless network 
is a huge burden. Well, so, it? right. And so yeah. when you talked about this having like, and Peter can correct me if I'm wrong, but splitting it off. So like We're not all the phones give them go one way necessary. and then everything else goes. And now I am not a, I like to dabble in technology, but you know, I'm not an expert on that. So I think that that's, that's kind of the way to do it. So that the instruction is, is really what's critical at the high school. So you've got the instructional piece. So you don't want to eat away at their bandwidth. Right. So. Yep. And Lori, we'll have an update for you on the Wi-Fi uh, costs by the end of the week. Well, there's Peter. Hi, Peter. Oh, thank you. How you doing, everybody? It's like the magic of the voice. And I also think, too, you. another part of the analysis that we can think about is, and again, Peter, correct me if I'm wrong, but my memory serves that um, given that the timeline for a cell phone tower is lengthy, mm -hmm. these three, this this ecosystem would be far, um, far more easy to implement from a time standpoint. So again, I think all of those things will be what we kind of analyze here in making a path forward. Good. Yeah. Good. So there's more to come next, <laughs> next meeting. Yeah. I mean, I think you should, we should probably expect to keep seeing, like, it's my intention to keep this on the agenda. So it's right in the forefront of, because I do think that we've all known about that we have an issue on the campus with communication. So it's like, let's just keep talking about it until we can, you know, make some headway. I, I would hope that uh, at this point, because it is so early, nothing's yeah. off the table. Nothing's off the table. No. For example, when we put the skate park in, we put a call box in. Yeah. Because everybody didn't have a cell phone in their pocket. Yeah. That, that was uh, very suitable for that. Yeah, nothing's, yeah. Off the nothing's off the table. We're in exploratory mode. I guess that's you know, probably the best way to describe it. So the cell phone tower can be the new COVID update on every agenda. <laughs> I won't even say that. It's not funny. Any other, any other comments? All good? All good? Thank All right. you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. All right. Uh, very quickly, CCHS early release. There is a calendar attached to the agenda with the 10 release dates. We will be voting on that in the action items. So I don't... Just to clarify, this is all part of the schedule changes that we've made. We um, had hoped to build in more early release. These are 115 releases, so it's an hour and a half-ish. It's not half a day. It's a period or so. So um, we're really excited to be able to do this. We saw in COVID with early release, the difference it made for kids to have a little um, edge off in the middle of the week and then give teachers time for collaborating and preparing together, which is exactly what it'll be used for. So we're excited this is a piece of the new schedule. And it's 10 days, yep. one, which we saw month. earlier. We saw that earlier um, in the year when we approved the calendar, but the dates were TBD. So now you have all those. And so all the early releases are at 115. It's not that they're these are new ones that are at 115, but the old ones are. Well, it's not quite that simple, of course. <laughs> um, of course. So the PD path days that we affectionately talk about all the time when the middle and high school are both out, those will be um, a little different than that because we need to start at one o'clock. So we'll clarify that. The, the true half day is like the day before Thanksgiving. Um, which is a strict three hour day. So we will be crystal clear with everyone as we roll all this out. We'll have to be because there are it's actually confusing. three or so options. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. So on to our action items. Um, all right. The first up, and I don't know if, let's see, let me see if we have motion. I have motion. I said, uh, I moved that the Comfort Trial School Committee's vote committee. Votes to approve the CCRSD FY23 Q3 quarterly budget transfers. Do we have a second? Second. Any further discussion? Hey, we actually have to vote these by um, roll call. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is just for region. Go ahead. Anderson, I. Who's I? Murano, I. Rainey, I. Rankin, I. What I for region? Wilson, I. Perfect. All right. And next up, we have the CCHS early release days for 23-24. Anyone have the motion? I've got it. I move that the Concord and Concord Carlisle School Committees vote to approve the 2023-2024 school calendar, including the 10 additional early release days at CCHS. Give a second. Any discussion? All right, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? 
All right. And last up is uh, a vote to approve the contribution for All Night Live. And this is from District Attorney Marion Ryan's office. Yes, we're eligible to apply. Um, it's probably the first year we've really tidied up enough to work directly with the All Night Live committee and have the paperwork we needed and effectively execute in a timely way, which we were able to do with their help. Um, and so we submitted and received a check in the mail yesterday. So yeah. there, it's going to be an exciting subsidy to the to the event. It's great. And it's a it's a grant, it's not a donation, right? It's a grant. Yeah, we yes, it's a grant. Yeah. Yes, sorry. Yes, Aaron and I debated the word for quite a while there. That's where yeah, <laughs> you can it's use grant, grant if you'd rather. Yes. Sorry. All right. Anyone want to make a motion? motion? Sure. I'll I'll move that the Conquer Carlisle Commit School Committee votes to approve a five hundred dollar grant from the Middlesex District Attorney's Office in support of the All Night Live alcohol-free event. Mm -hmm. Do we have a second? Second. I'm very excited about this event. You know, if you have a senior, it's very exciting that it's back here and the kids will have a great place June, to go. June, June 3rd. 3rd. Yeah, so graduation is June 3rd. You are all invited. You're invited to sit with the Not school. to All Night Live. Not to All Night Live for graduation. <laughs> and we'll send an email out. You can sit with the school they committee. Are still looking for volunteers. I was going to say you can volunteer. You, can volunteer. you kind of are invited. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. But if you have a senior, you shouldn't volunteer. Mm -hmm. So Sarah and I will not be there. You're exempt. You can guard it before. Yeah, so you can do the setup. And Cynthia, I'm very involved in the senior week activities. If you so remember, that's happening soon too. So anyway, yes, yes. Sometimes. Well, this time to have it back. Sarah and Tracy have yeah, more than put in their time. Tracks, yeah. uh, yes, you can. Yeah. Tracks, yes, you can. All right. So we are going to vote on this. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. And I would like to adjourn the.